call the meeting to order. This is not a regular board meeting. I almost feel like there's so many teachers here, we should do the Pledge of Allegiance. But, uh, <laughs> you want to let's go ahead and stand up and do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we'll call the meeting to order, and I will ask uh, uh, for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Mr. President, I move that the board approve the September 23rd, 2019 agenda. Second. <coughs> motion is second. Please vote on that. All right, the first part of our meeting is not a regular board meeting. It's a, it's a hearing to get comments from the community about certain issues. From time to time, the board does schedule public hearings to get input, and so that's what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, we have, I have four people signed up to speak, so uh, unless other people sign up, we'll give you up to five minutes each to speak. If more than that sign up, we'll probably try to limit everybody to, to three minutes. But. Uh, well, we have four signed up now. Other people come in, or anyone else here wants to sign up and speak, we can do that too. Well, if more than if any more signs up, we'll limit to three. Otherwise, the four that are that are signed up now can go up to five minutes. And so we're just going to hear from you. That's why it's called a hearing, and the board won't be <coughs> responding to questions or anything like that. We may get some clarification from staff on different things, but uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. And uh, Brian Wise is the first one who signed up to speak, so Brian, come on up. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Brian Wise. Uh, I'm an employee of the Ray Town C2 School District. This is my 26th year. Um, just asking, I'm past president of NEA. Um, I've been on Ray Team for the past 13 years. I'm here to talk about the tax rate just because I know how it's going to impact our district, and we've lived through some re really bad times in this district where the employees <laughs> gave up a lot. And I just think it's a bonus for us. I moved up here um, 11 years ago from Harrisonville. My son has since purchased a home here in Raytown. We believe in this town. We believe that when the voters vote, that they know what they're voting for. And we just want to make sure that everybody understands that we support the tax rate as it was approved. Um, I, I want to come and do that because I'm not afraid to speak to you all about the positive things that Raytown does, and that's what I do. I eat, breathe, and live Raytown and Herman, especially because that's my family. Um, but it's it's something that I, I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about my job, passionate about what you all do. I appreciate the board and what they do so much. Um, you allow us to do things that I never even thought was possible. And they hired me the first thing, and that's like this crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just want to say that. And I want to thank each and every one of you for what you do, because you do it on your time and not compensated, and I understand that. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Brian. Mr. President, <coughs> I want to make a statement about Mr. Brian. You stated your, your passion for the district. I just want to tell you that I have a mutual respect for you because I sense your passion. I mean, you walk and breathe your passion, so I just want to comment on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Amy Lowe Smith. Hi, I'm Amy Lo Smith. I teach at North Lee. This is my 11th year. Um, I'm the vice president of the Raytown MSTA. I'm also the daughter of two Raytown South Alumni Hall of Fame winners. And my um, husband's family, the Smiths, is one of the founding families of this community. That's why I chose to work here. I came here because I believe in this community. Um, so I'm also going to stand behind approving what the voters voted for. I see that we can use the money for a lot of different projects that I'm sure we'd all like to continue, to continue to make this community the great place that I've always known it to be in my entire life. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> I didn't realize you're the daughter of two Hall of Famers. That's pretty good. That's a lot to live up to, though. <laughs> Bridget Pitts. Hi, my name is Bridget Pitts. Um, I am an employee of the Raytown School District. I teach special education at Northfleet. Um, I believe this is my 18th year 
I'm going to stop keeping track. Um, I'm also the president of MSTA for our school district, um, and I also am a community member with children here. My daughter is 17, a junior at Raytown High School. She's also part of the CAPS program at Herndon, doing education exploration right now. And the things that she's done in September isn't even over. It's just been amazing. She's been to college visits. Uh, they went to Summit Tech today, I believe. She's just getting so much knowledge um, and things that have been done. My son, Patrick, is 11. Um, he's in Central Middle School this year. He is thriving. He's going through a little transition, but he's doing good. Um, and, you know, his orchestra, he's doing great. Um, I'm expecting, so I'll be giving another child to the district soon. <laughs> um, and not to take up too much of my time, but to concur with what Brian and Amy have already said. Um, I've been through this district when we had a lot of money. I've been in this district when we were frozen. Um, we all give a lot of ourselves personally to our school and to our children that are here. And I just am here to support that. And I am a member who voted. Uh, we live here in the district. My husband voted. And I believe that the people that I talked to um, and educated on it, that this is, that people voted and knew what they were voting for and would like it to stay the same. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Appreciate that. I do want to just add in that I appreciate the way MSTA and NEA works all together with Ray Team, and I think our bargaining system here in Raytown is probably the best of anyone. So appreciate all your work on that. Uh, Dennis Hilson. <laughs> Good evening. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of the voices that we've heard are teachers, people that live here in the community, and I feel like that's a strong kind of force that we have as people are invested, both in terms of their work and their living um, situation. We have kids in the schools. Um, I'm the president of an organization, NEA, that is close to 200 members now. We had quite a few sign up just this year. Um, and really, in conversations that we've had in the past, one of the big things that's always talked about, we have teachers that live outside of the district and inside of the district, but one thing that's always talked about with, um, we're, we're happy that the, the levy passed, we're happy that the bond passed and everything, but we always get nervous about the potential for those things not to pass because we realize what's happened in other districts, particularly Hickman, when uh, that district saw some support from, from the community that, that didn't allow the schools to stay on the top of their game. And that's when, that's when teachers leave districts, that's when families leave districts. So my issue, um, Really, I mean, I've heard, I've heard people have, um, have had problems with the way that, oh, transparency, we didn't know all the things um, that were out there. I, I'm not even concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is taxes. I'll always support taxes regardless um, for schools. Because um, to me, um, you know, that's, that's how you keep a community vibrant. That's how you keep people invested in the community. And for me, um, the thought that um, we would we would take a step back on any of that. I'm all forward. Let's let's keep the district moving ahead. Keep money in the schools. Uh, the things that are happening with the with the bond, like we're getting a roof over at um, Blue Ridge, and we needed that. And lots of programs where people are really excited about seeing, um, you know, new opportunities for our students. That stuff is exciting to me. So the prospect of not investing in the schools is really concerning to me. And and I do know from conversations that I've had with colleagues, people throughout the district, past and present. People have left the district um, because, oh, I can get a little more money here, a little more money there. If, if we don't have, uh, you know, the ability to, to pay teachers what other districts are paying, um, then that's what's going to happen to us. And so I, I don't like the thought of, of questioning, well, what was supported, what was voted on. If people want to get into the debate of how it was handled, that's fine, that's fair. Um, at the same time, I'm like... That, that's not even the issue for me. The issue is support the schools, support the kids. Right, Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, a couple of people wrote their names down and then scratched it out. <laughs> I'm sure you don't want to change your mind and speak to us. Anybody? Anyone else want to speak? Because right, we don't want to, we don't want to say that we cut things off too early, but that is all the people who signed in to speak. Anyone? <coughs> all right. Well, I appreciate you guys all coming out. But don't 
complete yet, so this part of the hearing is concluded. Uh, we'll keep that. Appreciate all four of you guys for speaking and everyone for coming out. We're always glad to see see you at the meetings and hear from from our staff. All right. The hearing is concluded. The next item is uh, a motion to set the tax rate. I entertain a motion. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Lakers. I move the board approve the proposed tax rate of 5.1600 for incidental and 1.1600 for debt service for a total tax rate of 5.3200 in compliance with RS Missouri section 137.073.2 based on the Jackson County Notice of Assessed Valuation 2019. Second. Just one, one minor correction, it's 6.32. Did I read you said 5.32. So. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, 6.32. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. President, I'd like to speak to the motion. Uh, before I do that, I, I want to, I, I heard what everyone said, and I, and I see the, the faces in the audience, and there's some suspicion about um, whether I'm an evil man or not. And, and I, I hope when I'm finished, uh, you will conclude otherwise. Um, I also want you to know that I uh, voted for, my wife and I voted for uh, the bond issue, and we voted for question two. Uh, I want you also to know that 20 years ago, my wife uh, ran the bond issue that produced a lot of the improvements to Raytown High School and Raytown South, and I was her gopher. And I think both of us did our jobs quite well. So when I look at you, I, I'm only asking that you, for a moment, um, think about what I'm going to say and, and just try to be open to it. I'm not, I don't want to take away, I don't think anybody in this community wants to reverse the decision that we all made in question two. But there are some facts I think we need to think about um, as we um, decide whether to approve the tax levy. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to share with my colleagues um, a handout, uh, feeling like a teacher, sort of, uh, to, if you don't mind passing that down, I would appreciate it. I have, um, I have a number of these. I brought, I, I heard a little rumor that there might be some people here tonight, and so I'm, I'm more than happy to, if you all want to take these and pass it around and follow as you will, I'd, I'd, I'd love you to do that. And if you, and, uh, okay, so, uh, I'll wait till you pass it around and then you can raise your hand. You, did you get one? There's another one. Oh, here's another one over here. Okay, anybody else? There's a couple more. Okay, so I wrote this, um, you know, after the football game yesterday, so there may be a few typos here, but I did the best I could. Uh, the, the, Tim and I were here to, were to answer the question, you know, what are the choices in setting the operating levy? Because we have choices. We, we have a motion on the floor where we can, where we can make some adjustments to that motion if we choose. Uh, but I wanted you to have some background information. Some of this you may know, and, and some of it you may not. And I'll read this to you and, and you can follow along. Uh, the Hancock Amendment is the Missouri law that limits increases in district revenues from tax windfalls during periods of inflation. It limits increases during reassessments by the lesser of the CPI, which is 2% in 2019, or 5%, unless a tax levy is approved by the voters. A school district can voluntarily reduce the operating tax levy. And I was taught this by Dr. Markley, who's pretty smart. Uh, number two, in 2019, Raytown School District's property tax reassessment increased property values by 13%. And uh, that information is provided uh, in one of these uh, uh, pieces of this motion. Uh, three, an operating levy increase was approved with a 54% vote. It increased the operating levy by roughly 14 cents per dollar 
of property value, and it was known as question two. This is an important point. However, the vote for question two waived the Hancock limitation unless the board acts tonight, and that means that they that it waived the ability for the for the taxes to be limited in this reassessment period to the lower of two percent or five percent. Uh, now, why is that important? Uh, well. Five, strangely, the public information regarding question two did not discuss the Hancock Amendment. It was also not discussed in public meetings. It's very complicated. I, I mean, I, it's, it's very complicated. Six, evidence suggests strongly that the administration did not discuss the Hancock 2% limitation with its board. So neither the voters or the board were given information that a vote for question two would effectively waive the public's rights to the Hancock limitation of 2% growth in tax revenues, a savings in taxes is really a $5 million number. Now, most local school districts did not propose a vote on an increase in their operating levy in 2019 and took the, and will take the 2% the tax limitation, with one exception. And that was, uh, I looked over at St. Louis in the Clayton School District had a case where they were uh, trying to raise six to seven million dollars and uh, they disclosed in their offering memorandum to the public how they would handle the Hancock Amendment. And if you flip to the back page, this is uh, item 34 of probably a 10 to 15 page document that was provided by Clayton School. It's right at the back of the material, very back. Uh, this is they had a Q&A, &A, and the Q&A said on item 34, uh, could the expected increase in countywide assessed values due to reassessments result in more revenue coming to the district from Proposition E that was originally projected? That's you know, that's kind of what we had going on. We had a property tax reassessment. They answered the question again before the vote. If assessed values increase due to reassessments as expected, the district could be in a position to receive more revenue than originally projected from the passage of Proposition E. However, the district administration is focused on its financial needs as demonstrated throughout this document and will recommend that the Board of Education commit to a voluntary rollback in the district's tax rate following the reassessment process to ensure that no more than $7 million of revenue originally projected from the passage of Proposition E is actually collected by the district. The Board of Education would vote on this voluntary rollback in September. Lastly, a voluntary rollback is a term used to describe the action taken by a taxing body such as a school district to not levy or charge the fully approved and taxpayer authorized rate. If a district voluntarily reduces their tax rate in odd-numbered reassessment years, the voluntary rollback will continue for two more years. But the point is, they had a similar situation. And they, it, it's fundamentally absolutely clear that they told the voters how Hancock works. And, and, and what's even more important is they said if the reassessment produces more tax than we're asking from the voters, we will limit only the amount of tax that uh, is being raised in the vote. We will limit to that amount and forego any taxes that would go with the reassessment. Now that's an example we had, and that's how they handled it. So, um, so eight, I've said here eight, Clayton proposed a $7.3 million increase in taxes in its reassessment year, but stated publicly that tax increases would not exceed that amount, regardless of results from their property tax reassessment. Their voters knew that the board would voluntarily roll back increases to the amount proposed of $7.3 million. Property values in increased in Clayton by 17%. The public vote was 64% favorable. That's called, that's called full disclosure. That's full disclosure. Okay, so where do we go from here? That's the rule. Those are the rules we're playing by, and, and, let's, and let's try to sort out what are the options here. Uh, tonight, the board needs to set the levy, and option one, I've got three options. Option one, the board can voluntarily roll back to the, the, the operating levy to the Hancock limit of a 2% revenue increase. 
which would increase local taxes by $666,000. The pros, it would satisfy the Hancock ardent proponents. Cons, it ignores the 54% public vote to increase the tax levy, which was Brian's point and which was the point of some other folks. Um, so, that's, we could do that. I'm not suggesting we should. Option two, the board can increase the operating levy by 14 cents as stated in the public vote on question two. This increases taxes by 1,041,000. Pros, correlate specifically to the public vote to increase the tax levy. Nothing's taken away. Respects information that was provided to the public when they voted. Recognizes that voters were not told that a vote for question two could waive their right to the Hancock rollback. Cons, does not maximize the revenue opportunity for the district. It does place stress on the 2019 fiscal budget, and it could drive reductions in overhead and administrative costs. Some people think that's a pro. I have no opinion. Three, option three, and this is the one we need to think about closely. Increase taxes for, for full property tax windfall. Increase, this would increase taxes by 5.3 million. The revenue percentage from reassessment then is 16.4% in 2019. Effectively, you're taking the whole benef benefit of the reassessment. Pros, prospects, uh, respects the technical argument that taxpayers waive their Hancock rights to prevent tax windfall by voting for an increase in the operating levy. That's the technical argument. The law does enable you to do that. It places, but it also then places responsibility on voters and the board to understand Hancock. And my argument is, if you weren't presented with the issue, how could you possibly understand it? The cons, this is, uh, the cons are it could increase uh, voter distrust. I mean, if we take the whole levy. It could increase voter distrust. Uh, there's no information regarding Hancock was disseminated. And I would love to have had this information at the time I voted, uh, but I didn't have it. It intensifies a public concern that property tax reassessment was mismanaged and unfair. <coughs> and you've heard about that. You've read about that. I'm not sure the two are related, frankly, but some say they are. And lastly, um, it ignores logic. It ignores logic that a taxpayer can understand Hancock. I'm here to tell you, if you probably got the message, you might not be able to understand it. But it does, it, it, it does get in the way of what happened in April. And that's why I'm presenting this information. Now, I believe, I believe that, I believe what's fair and we're talking about fairness here, and then, and then we're going to come back to the issues that you all addressed, which I, 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 the fairness issue is that we should respect the vote of the people, but we should take the position that Clayton took, and that is that money should be put in the, in the coffers. Then we should, uh, we should have another vote, and if we want to raise $5.3 million, then we should have a vote on the operating levy as soon as possible so that the voter knows exactly what they're voting on. And I believe, I believe, Brian, you're right. I, I would like to get the teachers more money. I'd like to do a lot more in the school for the benefit of the teachers, for the benefit of the kids, and, and reward you for what you did for my kids. But I want to do it with all the information in the hands of the voter. That's my speech, and so I'm voting for. I would hope I can make an amendment and uh, set forth a motion for approving uh, option B and following the wishes of the voter. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to take one issue with. I think it would be number five and possibly number six on your handout. Mr. Tony, um, at one of the public meetings, uh, the question was asked about if the tax levy did not pass, 
then what do we do next? And I'm not going to quote Dr. Shelton specifically, but he answered that question, and he referred to the, to the Hancock that we go back to that, and then in his conversation, he talked about if the assessed valuation goes up, you can only go up a certain amount of money. If it goes down, you can't lose to where you don't have enough money to operate. Um, but I do know that that was addressed at one of the public meetings out at the RSEC building. So to say that it wasn't made public, uh, I think that uh, is an inaccurate statement, uh, just based on the meeting that, that one meeting that I was attending. Um, and that's, I just wanted to bring that out. Thank you. Other comments? Mr. President, and again, uh, even though I understand the information that was brought to us from Clayton, I don't know that we know the entire uh, system or what was going on in Clayton uh, at that time and what they were voting for and however they were doing it. Uh, it was relevant to Clayton. I'm not sure that uh, how relevant that is to our situation right now. Uh, but I understand what you were saying that it was. And I, I respect that. Mr. President, before you speak, yes, sir. I'm going to say something. Uh, since you already spoken. Yeah, there's different things we could discuss here, but I will speak one thing about the Clayton issue. Uh, Clayton is either the first or second richest school district in the state. And what happens in St. Louis County in, in, a, in the second richest school district in the state can in no way be compared to what's happening here in our district and within Jackson County, which we all know has been completely mismanaged through the years, and they try to fix their mismanagement through what they're doing right now, and we're bearing the brunt of that PR-wise. And I've said all along I'm willing to look at rolling back something here as a good faith effort to pro provide taxpayers homeowner relief. But to couch this in the terms of we kept things from voters or voters didn't know or we knew all this and didn't tell, I, I don't go along with that at all. And I don't agree that comparing us to Clayton is a good, good way to look at it. But uh, that's my comment about the Clayton thing. May, may I Let me just see if anyone else wants to comment again first. Okay. Uh, Ms. Tittle. Mr. President. Yes. Um, this is our tax rate hearing tonight, and we've had four people who are employees of the district speak in favor of the motion. And <clears throat> as far as I believe that I will vote in favor of this motion. And um, I don't believe that we have public support to, to make any changes such as Mr. Chase is considering. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to get into intense argument here, but I have on my phone the entire um, bond memorandum of um, the Q&A of Clayton, and you're, and you're free. We can take a recess and you can read it, and, and uh, it might be the case that you think they're the, the wealthiest. Well, they're, they're hemorrhaging cash, and that's why they um, put forward this issue. Um, the issue of, um, of what we told the public, you know, we can have another recess and we can go get all the documents and all the public session information. And in my recollection, Edward <coughs> Hancock never appeared in any of this. And we're talking about a very technical issue here, a matter of law, very technical issue. And uh, so, um, it, but the, the real question is, uh, are, are, we, are we willing to say in voting yes that um, that the voter got uh, what they expected. The voter, the voter read uh, a million dollars and no tax increase. And uh, when we, if we walk out of here with this uh, tax rate, um, the entire uh, windfall from uh, the property tax reassessment is going to fall on their backs. And I don't think that was the intention of uh, Hancock when he wrote this thing back in 1980. I don't think it was the intention in 1996 when they reaffirmed it. Uh, but if, the, if there are four people that think that 
that is fair for the voters, then you do what you think is the right thing to do, and I'll do the right thing also. <clears throat> Mr. President, I'm just curious that legislation uh, is being proposed about rolling back uh, percentage of the uh, tax increases. Will that have any effect upon this? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand. Oh, somebody help me out here then. Yeah, there was a special committee that met yeah. a couple of weeks ago, and they were discussing the Jackson County and the St. Louis County assessments. Rolling it back to and so many they, millions. Well, there were several ideas came out of that, ranging from rolling back, you know, set freezing assessments to the point of uh, one idea was to freeze a house of whatever you bought it at. If you bought a house for 39000 and stayed at that until you sold it again, and it might be worth 250000 So they're going to they're going to try and, and figure something out. I, I don't think it would impact this, but it may in future years. Well, it's supposed to impact 2019 taxes. I don't think, you know, the only way the taxes could be impacted this year when you set the levy or anybody sets their levy is if they protest their taxes, okay? Uh, they can protest them and, and have their, they can protest their evaluation, their evaluation, uh, and have their hearings down at Jackson County, but I think that ship has probably sailed. So the next step they have is they can protest their taxes. <coughs> people do that. It's generally left to or, or corporations, things like that, that protest their taxes. The county will hold that money in escrow uh, until that matter is settled. Um, how much we have a, a year in that is pretty minimal compared to districts that have large corporations that are like in St. Louis County um, and, and different districts that have you know, more commercial property. So I don't think it will impact this year, but if they change the legislation, it could change the way things are done in the future. But we don't know that yet. Okay. Mr. Mr. President, I'm sorry. Let me finish my thought then. The thing that concerns me is that if we, and I understand the voters have voted for a certain dollar amount, I understand that, and you want to honor what the voters are saying, but if there's some kind of backlash that comes to the district as a result of this, that concerns me. If information is uh, put out, or is already out, that we were not transparent in our decision, to bring this before the voters. I think that will hurt the district. I am in, I think uh, Rick had stated that he was in agreement for a percentage to be rolled back. I would buy into that because of the fact that I think it does show good faith. That's my personal thinking there. Well, I, I, I appreciate Dr. Markley speaking. Um, uh, did you include a discussion of Hancock in any of the public documents? Um, I didn't recall that you did. Um, and but if you if you didn't, why didn't you include a discussion of Hancock? Well, we didn't have anything specifically what Clayton has here. And Clayton's a different is a different school district, and it may be hemorrhaging money, but their assessed valuation is almost 1.2 billion and they have half the students that we had. Um, and my guess, and this is purely a guess, but um, I, we could go and look and, and confirm, but the amount of new construction money that's coming into Clayton softens the blow on their levy as far as what they have to roll back. Whereas we have about, see what, 250,000 in new construction money, so new construction doesn't help us. So whatever the scenario is for them, that's, we'd have to look and see. We didn't discuss the Hancock Amendment because we didn't think it was going to be an impact because in previous years, our assessed valuation didn't go up more than 2, 2.5% two and, uh, and barely reached the CPI in any given oh, year. Down. In some years, in off, in off years, which is non-reassessment years, it actually did decrease some. And if you, if you look at the numbers, you can see where it's dropped some. So we had no idea that the, the Hancock was going to be something that we were going to have to deal with because we didn't expect that the increases to be this large. Uh, Mr. President, may I respond to that? Um, as I recall, Kansas City Star had an article where we invested $15,000 along with monies from other school districts to, in, to hire the consultant that uh, was the leader of the Jackson County property tax reassessment. So, and that was, in, that was probably in June, May, June 
of uh, 2018. So, um, and, and I suspect, and no, I know that there was some information that had been provided uh, by the consultant and by Jackson County um, following the hiring of that consultant. So, to say that you, you didn't believe Hancock would kick in because historical increases had only been 2%. Well, the reason they were 2% was because they had a bad property tax system, and that's why, that's why they were hired. And, um, and if, we, if, we, if we spent that amount of money, we reasonably would have believed that the amount of property tax incre increase would, it, would be higher than 2%. So I'm, I'm struggling with that one, but I would like to understand again why then we, why didn't we include Hancock in the disclosure of documents? Clearly Clayton is a different situation. But that didn't preclude us from talking about Hancock. As I said before, you know, that you talk about the information that we were given. Uh, as we worked through the process, we didn't see an increase from the, the people that were doing the work for Jackson County to be more than 5%. Uh, and 5% as far, and when you balance that with new construction, we didn't feel like Hancock was going to impact us uh, because the, just the money was not, would not have been there. Now, you know, we spent, we were one of eight school districts that partnered uh, together to get these assessments right. And prior to you getting on the board uh, in April, and this, members of this board were part of it, this board actually sued Jackson County, uh, I believe in 2015, because mm -hmm. the commercial values were upside down in this district and amongst all over Jackson County. So we didn't feel like the Hancock wasn't even in the back of our minds at that point because we didn't believe the increase was going to be that large from the information that we had and we were given. Could I say something? Um, <clears throat> Saturday morning I was laying in bed watching the news and KCTV5 did a story on um, some of the emails that have come through the county <coughs> on all this. I don't know if anybody saw that. One of the things that was addressed in there was the fact that even in March, which would have been two weeks, late March, two weeks before this vote even, that the county was shocked at where the numbers were coming from and couldn't explain them. And so for me, I just felt real validation in that story saying, how were we supposed to know when the county themselves were not even aware that these increases would happen? So I just wanted to add that. I'll, I'll add a couple more things what Al said about the uh, the consultant. Our whole basis for the lawsuit and for this consultant was based on what was going on on the commercial side because we thought it was blatantly unfair that the commercial side was being so undervalued and the taxes were being borne by the by the homeowners and that's that's where our emphasis was and even if they had made up only that correction on the commercial side it wouldn't have amounted to this much increase so we we had no inkling that this was uh, going to be happening this way or that uh, Jackson County was going to try and correct everything all in one year. The other thing is, is because we've had, this is either the third or the fourth bond since I've been on, on the board, and we handled this exactly, exactly the same way we've handled every other time. We haven't had a discussion of Hancock because what we do has never been based on what the county has done, and our experience has been that it's all in the last 15 years has been declining or stagnant increases. So we ran the campaign, ran the information exactly the way we've done every other one, and not in an effort to mislead or keep information from voters. I don't think we did have a discussion of Hancock in some of the informational meetings, but I know that I had discussion about Hancock with you guys because I've talked about that. Mr. President, Mr. Burke. I had the privilege today, just today, to uh, visit a few departments in the district and, uh, and taking note of what was said here today. Um, the voters voted for it and uh, investments in school need to be made. Learned that today we got about $200 million worth of projects improvements that need to be made and uh, we're going to need another bond issue to one thing that I, I know is that people are willing to make sacrifices I voted for both 
the questions that we're debating right now. And Hancock didn't matter then, didn't matter, doesn't matter now to me. And I know I don't think I'm so different from everybody else that lives in the community. Um, whenever there's a, I think it is viable uh, to this community because the community voted for it. And they understand how crucial it is for our, for the quality education that we want to provide. And also finding out that, you know, where our teacher salaries stand and, and different improvements that we need to be that need to be made. I think this is an opportunity for us to uh, to benefit from from what has happened and, and anyone that has had a problem with the increase the uh, beyond what we all imagine there 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 are things being done it's not because of the school district it's, it's because of the county doing it all in one year. <laughs> And I don't think anything we did increase caused the increase more than what we imagined. It was this is I don't think this is the right place to voice that concern. One final point and then I oh I'm sorry. One final point. Dr. Markley on March first, did you receive a document from Jackson County? Uh, uh, assessor's office uh, identifying what our assessed value would be at that date? I think we had a preliminary. Did it say 2%? 2% uh, increase? No, it didn't say 2%. What did it say? I think commercial wise it was around, help me Steve on that exactly. Residential was 14%. 14% on March 1st? Something like that. So on March the 2nd we could have put together a, an amendment to our dot to our flyer. They could have said Hancock's going. Hancock, Hancock is going to kick in. That's 14 percent windfall. So I, I think we had time from. I'm suspecting we had time to take the pay to add a page to our discussion with the community that we knew that there was going to be a substantial increase in the values of properties in Jackson County because that number apparently showed about 14 percent. Well, what well, you're means, asking him is would have taken board action and I would not have voted to at that time to take any action based on what we thought an ineptitude incompetent county was going to do one month before our own election to set the <laughs> no way, no way this board would have done that. Uh, Dr. Markley. Yes. Okay, here's the thing that concerns me as I stated before. Okay, if we're going if if Residents are going to bear the blunt of this. What is your thought if we roll back a percentage? I want to hear from administration. If okay. we rolled it back a percentage. Yeah, Steve, you got that. We passed down. Yeah. You got everybody's got a copy of this. <clears throat> Sheet looks like this. Yeah. While he's looking that up, I'll just say one more thing. Got this form, it does list several scenarios. And as strongly as I've stated here about this issue, I'm still willing to go along with some, if, if there's, uh, if the board feels so, I'm willing to go along with a rollback to provide some tax relief to homeowners. And I think that's a good, I think it's a good sign. It shows that we, we understand, it's sort of like, we understand the pain of what has taken place, the, the impact that it's going to have on you, and the district is willing to make a, a adjustment. Yeah, because through no fault of our own, we're willing to provide some some relief because right. we understand that this has happened and it's yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah. If you look at the if you look at this form, it shows different scenarios, and the bottom one is probably where we if we did something where we want to make a change. Let's just say if we roll back the levy by 15 cents in debt service, we would be able to give a million dollars back to tax relief for the community. 
And it would not have a great impact on the district as far as... We would still be receiving more revenue than we thought we were way okay. back in November when we put this on the ballot. And I'm hopeful with that additional revenue we will use that opportunity to get our teacher salaries back to uh, a competitive level right. where they should be. All right. So sorry, that's okay. Um, you have this sheet right here in front of you. The top columns, rows and columns are um, the operating side and in, in yellow, and then the green is the debt service side. Uh, you can see where uh, you had a voter approved on the operating side from 516, and we have scenarios going all the way down to where the Hancock rollback of if we uh, rolled it back, what Hancock would require $4.53. Okay. And you can see if you look going from left to right, you can see the total lo local operating revenues that that creates uh, and against expenditures and where that ends, uh, either in deficit spending or surplus and where the balance ends. And at the bottom, same scenario. Uh, you see the 116. Now there's a difference between, again, um, piece of school finance education on the operating side. Hancock does not affect debt service. Okay. This board is the one that decides on what its debt service is. The, and that all depends on the bond <laughs> issues that are passed uh, and when the voters approve a bond issue or to refund a bond, issue, a, a bond <coughs> that are already out there. It impacts your, your, uh, what you're able to levy because of what you owe uh, on principal and interest payments throughout the life of these bonds or multiple bonds that you have. Okay, the, this district all, has always rolled back your debt service levy because it's it's ranges anywhere from a dollar seventy up to a dollar ninety depending on what what uh, what the principal and interest payments are. Uh, but you could, as you can see there, you've got different scenarios again um, on the debt service side. It's important to note that we have a, a healthy debt service balance of sixty three point four seven percent. The state auditor would tell you that you need a year's worth of uh, payments uh, for balances in case the sky falls, or whatever the case may be. That's the state auditor saying that. That's not necessarily school district saying that. Could you spend down your, your balances in debt service? Sure you could, but there may come a time when you have to increase that uh, to make sure you're meeting those obligations. Keep your bond ratings where they're at. Uh, Mr. Tony can speak to that probably better than anybody in this room is, uh, because he dealt with that a lot in his career, uh, what ratings of bonds, etc. are. So, that's what you've got right there. You can roll it back. Uh, if we would recommend rolling back, we'd recommend on the debt service side because that's where your balances are at. Uh, on the operating side, if we want to, right now we're currently uh, in the starting base pay of teacher salaries. Uh, in a number of districts that we have, we don't have that list for you, but um, we're at 37000 on the base. Uh, and the only ones in the immediate area that are lower than, uh, than us are Hickman Mills. Uh, the least summits, the Fort Osage, the Grand Views, the rest of them are they're telling the NEA folks or MSTA they know that because they get the salary uh, schedules. And at no fault, that's not saying this board hasn't done anything with salaries because we've been giving steps over the years and increasing through steps and we've ignored the base because uh, that's a conversation and I'm going to talk about that in more goals later than individual goals. Uh, we need to have Ray team start talking about, well, we summit a couple years ago, they didn't give a step, they put everything on the base. Okay, Maybe that's what we start doing. That's a conversation to, to be more competitive on that side because that money flows right up through the salary schedule anyway. So that would be our recommendation as a starting point. Well, there's a motion on the floor and, and, and a second. Mr. President, I'd be willing to. I'd be willing to. Go ahead. Um, is there a the way we is there a figure on if we did roll it back a million or whatever um, is there a number for as far as the average tax what's this what's the amount of savings an average taxpayer would I don't think it's worth you're able to tell other than say like per thousand dollars of assessed valuation because everybody's house is so different. different I'm just saying just as far as a million what? dollars how many taxpayers are there and what is that number? Let's say let's say you got um, okay. I see what you're saying. What's let's say we give a million back. Use the county for example. The county said they would give three million dollars back, and there's over three hundred and some thousand parcels uh, that's got to be split between that million. So 
as far as what they're getting back is probably, you know, as far as the three, all of us, and anybody that lives in Jackson County, you're not getting very much back from that three million. Uh, it might be a little bit more for us. So say a hundred thousand uh, dollars. I wouldn't even say that. Say a million dollars and divide that by the twenty. What's up, Twenty-seven thousand. <coughs> Now, that's a dip, that's just parcels. You got to think about what people are paying property tax on yeah. their vehicles too. Right. So the just percentages wanted, are different. Just, I commercial, just commercial, wanted, commercial no. is different <laughs> because it's a thirty-two percent tax rate. Residential is a nineteen percent tax rate. Yeah. The personal property is a, disca a, a yeah. descaling, sliding scale of depending on how old your vehicle is. Nothing I can paying. find out. So, so okay, it's tough to calculate. Yeah, Mr. President. Um, I, I can appreciate the thought of rollback, and I understand where it's coming from, but if we're looking at a million dollars in the overall scheme of things, that's really not very much to divide among the rest of us as, as we were trying to figure out what it was. Um, I would like to give them more credit to the voters that they do understand a little bit about the Hancock and, what it, and how it affects them. And what it means and um, they did vote for the levy uh, with the understanding I think most people understand if their assessed valuation goes up they're going to pay a little bit more taxes if it goes down they're going to pay uh, less taxes uh, so based on that um, I really don't see where we need to uh, roll this back Let's vote with what we got. Or go with what we got. You know, I'm just thinking here. I understand uh, where we where we at, but I think what Mr. Toady was saying to us was, um, did we? And I understand Dr. Marcus said that that wasn't a thought because of the fact that he didn't think of the large increase. But given the fact that there is a large increase and the fact that if the Hancock amendment was not, information was not shared, that how it would impact the voter, would it made a difference in the voters? Maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't have. We don't know that because it's a past tense. But I am just thinking really realistically about the damage to the district. Is that going to do damage to the district? And I've heard from the four uh, uh, members from the staff, but you know, it's kind of like <laughs> you you got to say something positive, and I'm not saying that you did, I'm just saying the perception. But the real voters outside of us, the people outside of this room, are they, well, their perception of the district, will they perceive that we were, we misled the, dis the, the voters? I'm just concerned about that, and I don't think we within this room can answer that question. So I'm just thinking that we should do something that indicates that we understand the pain of increase, financial pain. Ms. Salisbury, I, I, I don't think it would do what you're saying. I don't think there would be a backlash, but I agree with the other part, and that's why I'm I'd like to entertain an amendment to roll back on the debt service side something to say that we acknowledge that at the very least. And what, if we do this on the debt service side, it doesn't keep us from rolling this back up next year if we find that it's necessary or we need to. And it doesn't keep us from making some uh, needed adjustments in the operating issues specifically with, with teacher salaries and doing some things here. So if there is any interest, I would entertain a, a motion to uh, uh, roll back the deck service levy by 15 cents, and that would uh, give a million dollars this year back to the, to the homeowners, to the taxpayers. If there's any interest, someone's going to have to make that, that motion as an amendment. Don't we need to deal with the current one that's on the well, oh, be, be making an amendment. Amending it. But if there's not, and there's no further discussion, we can vote on the, the, the motion that's on the floor. I'll make the motion. 
I make the motion to amend the, uh, the motion that's on the floor now. To, to reduce the debt service the debt levy service by 15, 15 cents? Percent, yes. 15 cents, it's not 15 percent. I'm sorry, 15 cents. cents. Is there a second to that motion to amend? Oh, excuse me. I will second that motion. Any, any discussion on the amendment, on the motion to amend? Well, I, I would, yeah, I'd just like to make a comment. I, uh, I appreciate um, the group uh, considering thoughtfully um, my point of view. I'm, I'm concerned that if we give a million back, that's the million that the voters <coughs> agreed to. Uh, it's kind of a circular sort of argument. But I, I, don't, I, I, I think it, it certainly respects the argument but um, in these challenging times, um, I'm, I'm concerned it's not enough. And also, uh, I know we've said a lot about what the, what the voter would do. Look, it was only a 54% win, and um, that's not much, given what, how many 2,000 have voted on it. And uh, so I, I, would be, I, would be, I would struggle with supporting that, although I think it certainly is a step in the right direction, but um, we're, still gonna, we're still going to be looking at a lot of money going through the wallets of people in this community, and uh, and and I, I I'm struggling with that uh, that aftermath. Just one reminder, one small correction: the the issue passed by 58 percent. Excuse me, 58 percent, not 54 percent. 56. 56. 56. 56. All right. <laughs> Any other discussion on the motion to amend? All right, let's vote on the motion to amend. Just to vote on it. Where are we? Is this a vote? This is a motion to amend. The amendment. Yeah, the amendment. Is that what's on here? This is a vote. This is a voting. This is voting to amend only. This is not voting to approve. Yeah, okay, I have it. The motion to amend is to reduce the debt service levy by 15 cents. If you're in favor of that, you would vote yes. <coughs> All right, the motion to amend fails, so we have the original motion on the floor. I think we did. We, Mr. Toady, didn't you make? Didn't you had a motion? No, I didn't make a motion. motion. I can't remember. No, I didn't. Okay. Thank you, though. I will, but I don't know if it'll get a second. <coughs> Correct. Any further discussion? All right, vote on the motion. The motion passes. All right. I will just say one final thing. I do appreciate you teachers and staff being here, but especially the Ray team. You know how supportive this board is of the issue we talked about, but we do expect some changes in the way we discuss pay increases this year. All right. We want to do some stuff on the base, raise the whole thing up, and not just do the stuff with the steps we've been right, doing. Right. All right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. I think you you should want to stay for the rest of the exciting part. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk about some other fun stuff. <laughs> you don't stay all right, next time. No, I'm scared. Yeah. Sunshine Law Review. <clears throat> Ryan, we're going to get yeah, yeah, going to give us our thing on that. All right. Yeah, wherever you feel comfortable with her. Um, some time ago, I'll just let me set this up for him and he can put it on T and he can hit it. Um, <laughs> the board had, had a request that uh, Shelly's office just kind of give an overview, quick overview of Sunshine Law and, and uh, 
since we had some new board members on, uh, I thought it would be a good idea, and he's promised me it's not going to be more than five or ten minutes. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, board members, I, we, we do get a chance to talk about the Sunshine Law. The Sunshine Law, is, as the name uh, indicates, what you do in, in this forum is a public forum. You're a, a public governmental body, as, as you all know. Uh, the fact that we've got, got some new blood on the board, and it's truly it's a good refresher for all of us because we go back and look at this all the time. Uh, I've still got my, my old booklet that I use all the time to reference. I know you've got the booklets that were provided to you that are, that are the updated versions. Um, the basic premise is that when we take action as a board, number one, uh, they've, got, they've got a couple of definitions in there that are really important. Public meetings, a, quorum, uh, a public body meets and public business is discussed, whether that's in person, by email, by text, that's me. <coughs> the new, that didn't used to be a consideration 15, 20 years ago when we, we didn't have electronic meetings. Uh, we can have meetings without you all being in the same rooms. Uh, we've got some pretty good case law that's come out uh, that talks about you can have meetings by way of text and in different situations. So that's, that, that's a concern that we have. And as we conduct ourselves, uh, as you all communicate, and communication's been made very simple, but uh, I'm going to talk about some of the most common missteps that we, that we see with our boards that we represent here in a little bit. Um, another one of the basic premises is that just in Sunshine Law that, that this body acts as a body, that one individual or individuals in and of themselves in a group of less than four uh, in a quorum situation, less, and again, I use that word as anybody not familiar with the word quorum, it's four out of seven. Uh, so as we as we conduct our business, it's in it's in that group setting, um, and what this what this group prefers to do. The the other basic premise is that what you're doing is open to our to our public members and open to individuals that that put you in these positions, and the the bodies that we deal with day to day. That's the the guidelines that they operate on. Now along with those that that uh, assumption and that that starting point, we have exceptions. And in your book, you're going to find 24 exceptions that are listed uh, in the Missouri statute. The ones that we most commonly use in, in this setting, legal actions, uh, hiring, firing, promoting, disciplining employees. Now, I do want to note that the vote on anything related to employment is, is ultimately going to be final, or pardon me, is going to be public. And that's going to be released within 72 hours or can be. Um, the student information that's discussed in discipline hearings, things like that that we've appeared before you. Those things are, are accepted from Sunshine, of course. Uh, and those things become closed record. These things I'm talking about are the areas where we want you to, to be able to have free discussion and exchange of your ideas um, in, in a closed session. Specs for competitive bidding, sealed bids, those things obviously are going to be closed until, until open to the public. Uh, personnel records, uh, for those of you that are, that are in education and have your own personnel files, my, my parents certainly did. Uh, those personnel records, to, to the most, uh, to a large extent, are closed for, for good reason. Uh, when we start talking about personnel records, you've got board policy that speaks of what Dr. Markley and what, what our other administrators can talk about as people move on from our district. It's name, length of service, uh, salary, and position. That's, that's the standard. Uh, confidential information from and between the district and its auditors, and obviously with, with attorneys, and then security plans and settings. So those are the important closures. Those are the important areas where we're, we're going to talk about those things in closed close, uh, meetings. Why do we do it? Why is it important? And that's, that's really what, what uh, we probably need to hear and need to talk about. It's because of the liability on the other side that you lose your protections as, as a board. You lose your protections with your auditor, with legal counsel. Uh, if those things are discussed in, in an open in an open forum, so the fact that we've got uh, certain things when you're getting advice, uh, and again these are advice. It's advice that helps you make informed decisions. Those things, as we talk and we talk about work product, those are the things that that uh, it, it's it's the if you will the genie behind the curtain. It's it's the that part of the Wizard of Oz that we're gonna we're gonna make our final action, and this board portrays itself as as the body. Uh, when it does that, we're doing that in, in public, and we should. But the, the, the work that goes on behind sometimes, uh, and, and again, the discussion, it's to give you all the protection of knowing that you can discuss those things in closed session, honestly, and, and open. Most common missteps, and again, I'll, I'll uh, hit these quickly, the reply-alls on emails. Uh, that's, that's something that we've got we've to watch. And again, 
I'm not picking on this board. This is a list of things that we kind of talked about at the office that we see with all of our boards. Um, and again, just because you don't reply all, sending three different emails to less than a quorum, if that's in an attempt to frustrate that, that action, that's not going to work a lot of times, uh, and that's not going to be something we do. Group texting, uh, discussing items outside the agenda, discussing closed session items outside of closed session. Those are, those are probably the biggest, the biggest things that we see, uh, the most vi often violated issues with closed records. We've got, we've got one good li liability issue or one good liability case I wanted to talk to you about tonight. This is a recent case. We talked about it a lot in 2017. Um, and again, I, I know how well compensated you all are. So anytime you start talking about getting into your pocketbooks for the work you're doing here, uh, I like to be very careful. I like to make you very aware of what your rights are. There was a Friends of, of Responsible Agriculture versus Missouri Department of Natural Resources case. Um, it came down in 17. And it was a case in which, again, you're going to ask how this relates to you, and I'll make this quick, but it was a case where the DNR was looking at hog farms uh, on behalf of the state. And they had set an agenda to go look at, to go look at one specific site. And in doing that, they had some members, as they were out and about, decided, hey, we're driving by some of these other possible sites. Let's take a look at those. They started texting one another, uh, more, than, more than three of them. And as they, as they toured these other sites, they, they came into information that wasn't available otherwise. So essentially what we had was we had, we had a meeting that had not been noticed up, improperly noticed, uh, because the, the, they, act, they actually had noticed up the, the uh, tour for one, one farm. They visited three or four. And when, when that happened, um, they also had their attorney present. They, they got hit, the responsible, uh, the Friends of Responsible Agriculture sued Department of Natural Resources. And they got hit for uh, a judgment for violating sunshine. It was 18,000 bucks in attorney's fees. That's, that's usually the hammer. Because this, this taxpaying group brought that suit, got their attorney's fees. The other, <coughs> the other remedies that were, that were imposed by the court in Cole County, there was a $5,000 fine from DNR that was paid to Cole County. There are certain instances that it's, in, it's a part of your pamphlet, but uh, you'll notice that the, it's not just the board itself. Uh, our members can be fined. You can be fined up to $1,000 for a knowing act or up to $5,000 for a willful act. So, uh, again, I appreciate the fact that you all are serving on this board. I don't want to see you incur any liability in order to the citizens of Raytown. So that's why it's important that we respect Sunshine. Uh, I will tell you that there are, and you ask how the, how that hog case or the hog farm case came to, to light, there was an interest group on the other side of that, obviously, that as with many of our issues that we tackle, there are interest groups that are out there that are watching what we do publicly. And so the fact that we're, we're conducting public business, it's important because there's usually a watchdog of some sort, and, and a lot of times rightfully so, uh, that, that is watching what we're doing and, and making sure that we're doing business above board and within the bounds of that, that statutory basis. So, this is a question, and this is this is actually more work session now. You guys will be a little bit more informed. But so, help me understand with real examples. So, if we're emailing back and forth, and we we email a lot. We need to be able to do that. But so, if we're emailing about a bid, for example, are you saying like so maybe someone who didn't get the bid? would file a complaint against us and then if something came out then we could be fined you said a thousand or five thousand what would it's there are two different levels there's a there are statutory definitions of knowingly and, and purposefully basically that you're, you're considered to have knowledge of the sunshine law so any violation pretty much is going to be knowingly um, but if there's evidence of willful a willful attempt to to frustrate the sunshine law and that's that's what the uh, the dnr got hit with because they they had their attorney on board during their tour. They were fined five thousand dollars as a board total. So um, that's a purposeful. They the court at least considered that a purposeful violation of Sunshine Law. So yeah, you're exactly right. Well, is, he, is it even possible to give notice that there's going to be a meeting via email? Yes. How do you do that? We we give notice of electronic meetings just like we do. It's it's part of our board policy. Uh, and again, that's where email. Again, I'm not picking on this board at all. That's where email has gotten very difficult, even text messages, group texts for, for our public bodies, is that those can be meetings. And again, that, that, it goes back to the definition of public business. Does if, a violation occur when the email is sent, or would it occur when someone 
wants to get that information and maybe it was not made available to them. The the violation in that in that situation is going to be when the email is sent. If, if we're conducting public business in a in a setting where we've got a quorum and we're we're talking about that in that email setting, uh, that that the violation occurs when that email is sent. Absent of a reply. Well, and again, I'm talking about if if we're doing that uh, back and forth. Well, not only back and forth. That's that's where we get in trouble. And and a lot of times, again, this is where we've had many situations where boards are scheduling a meeting, and they're they're talking about just the scheduling of the meeting. When can people be available? We're talking about schedules and not conduct of public business. And then someone replies on and says, "Hey, and what about this issue? What are we going to do? Or, or what are we going to talk about?" That's that's where we get in trouble. And again, um, so it, it's, the it's a common. It doesn't that doesn't need a reply to be a violation. If if someone sends out again. It, you can be conducting public business. I'm sorry, Andrew, I'll get to you. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Just if someone's you. conducting business and sends that that email, there doesn't necessarily have to be a reply. It can just be the email itself to, to that to that group, and you're conducting business. Yes, sir. Yeah, the uh, I read that Colombo <coughs> case, the Colombo case that Schmidt cites on on uh, on Sunshine, and I, and what I remember was that um, willful intent. Uh, does have significant bearing on the outcome of the Sunshine case, which then led me to think, well, okay, um, if if um, you're simply sending a document to to the six other members, and it's I'd like to consider this at the next board meeting, then yes, you may have violated Sunshine, but by putting it in Rachel's basket. Then, then who's ever shopping for lawsuits can go, the, the, the remedy would be, sure, we'll give it to you. But that would, not, that would not strike the heart of the willful intent language, which, at least I'm, I'm asking the question, it doesn't seem like it would, which would lead you to a potential liability of 1000 to $10,000. Now, respond to that. It's a, and again, I think it's going to be, uh, they're going to look at the history, and as the Columbus case history, okay. and as, as this, uh, D Department of Natural Resources case says right. they're going to consider the conduct as a whole. They're okay. going to consider the intent, and, and again, that that right. comes down to a fact, a fact evaluation, and it's right. it can be different in in certain cases in between even the same board. So, um, is it something that occurs on a regular basis? That's what they start talking about, and as as these arise and discovery is had, uh, and they start digging through our minutes and our, our communications. That's what really becomes important is, is the practice in general of the board and how, how you've conducted business or how a board has conducted business right. for, for a period of time. So let me, let me run back. So if you send an email and copy the other members, I really enjoyed the football game and we need to do some work on fixing up the football stadium. Think that goes in the file and nothing happens. I mean, is that, it, you may have some exposure, but that it seems like a fairly innocuous sort of facts that someone the remedy would be sure go get the go get the email out of Rachel's and see if you want to you want to fight it go I mean you want to go search sure. go ahead but I'm just, I, that doesn't seem like a, a likely sort of outcome that somebody's going to really charge it with something and it doesn't and I when it comes to sunshine law violations to be honest it's uh, again like I said. It's not an issue until until someone makes the request. Okay. It's not an issue until someone uh, right. makes an issue of it, to be honest with you, right. because a lot of these things happen, and again, I'm not picking on our, our smaller schools. Um, you know, at some of our smaller schools, when you get when you get the football team together, get the, they're watching games, uh, if you've got a, you know, 50, 60 parents in the stands, and they're, they're shooting, shooting the ball behind the tailgate after the game, you, you may have a quorum there okay. with your board members. Sure. Uh, that those kinds of things happen. It's yeah. just it's a pattern in practice. Okay. So honestly, when those things, uh, when requests come and discovery occurs, mm -hmm. if there's a pattern in practice of mm -hmm. doing that, and again, it may not rise to the level of willfully or purposefully. Mm -hmm. But um, my concern for for any board member or any any government servant in that in that case would be if that pattern's established, that uh, yeah. at least that knowingly that knowing violation. But sending out just a like general email that is like informational to all the board members, that's not conducting a meeting. 
It depends on the nature of the information, Mr. Moore. Um, to the extent that we're, we're conducting actual public business, it can be. Uh, to the extent that it's just sending out, and again, I, I, I hate to speculate without knowing if you've got an example, I can I can weigh in. But if you're if you're conducting, well, okay, I'll talk about two specific is, things. I mean, Rachel sends out the information for the board meeting before the board meeting. That's obviously not a violation. No, because you've got to be you've got to be prepared when you come. But, then, but it's information. There's a lot of information being sent out there. But Mr. Now, Moore, what about if she does that two days ahead, so it's posted to the public that because she sends it, it's sent to us on on uh, electronic school board, but it's also posted for the public to look at if they want to. Yeah, so I'm so, saying it's obviously not a violation. Because it's posted. Right, but what about if I, because I send out information to the board, if there's a, a news article that they should read, this, but just general information, and I send that FYI and have a link to the news article, that's not a violation. It's not It's not per se a violation because you're, you're not discussing your board business. Okay, well, if it's, here, here's an article that I think is important, or here's an article about us, here's what we ought to do next time. Once you cross that line, it becomes the conduct of this board's business. That's when we have issues. Sending sending a link or you know an article on the Jackson County tax assessments, not not in well, not that, ads. something else. <laughs> well. so, an opinion. If you're stating your opinion or your stance on that issue, that could be, or you're asking for. It. What do you think about this? And again, if you're asking this, this group to consider uh, action on a particular item or, or if you're conducting, again, I think that phrase of conducting business, it's defined in our books here, but um, when, when we've got the, a quorum together that's, that's conducting your public business, I hate to, to define the, the word with, with the word. Probably the best example would have been if I had sent that outline and copied everyone, that would have been considered conducting business. Potentially, and really, just potentially, I would have thought it would be answered because it had a it, because we because that would have been. I mean, that would have been if a lot of those things that they go to Rachel, oh, and, really? and if they're out okay. in, the, in the public, um, huh. okay, it's it's really a lot of judgment. Yeah. The biggest thing is to make sure we don't ever email something that should be contained within closed session discussion, correct? And once you once you've identified an item as a closed session item, again. It's not that it doesn't happen, but when you do that, you forfeit your you forfeit your privacy. So don't conduct business. Protection. Don't don't send out closed session information. That closed session information should be discussed in, in these in these rooms, with the exception of agendas uh, and things that are that are required to set up the closed session. So let's throw another wrinkle into it. Okay, I, I need to get information out to you guys about a a, a bad situation between a student or a, a serious situation. And I send an email, I copy you, um, I copy Rachel, and I send it out, I say confidential uh, for your eyes only, and push that information out. Where are we at? Yeah. That, that's attorney work product, that's, that's attorney client privilege information. Again, as long as that information stays, it's been, it's been addressed to, to us as well, uh, that, that information can be protected. As long as no members in this body have that discussion with anybody out in the public, then they're, protect, they're protected under the attorney. Truth. And again, but, but even in that situation, I think one of the keys is that we don't start applying all right. and start conducting that public right. business without noticing up a meeting. Am I to understand that when he sends out emails to the board, if, as long as we don't reply back to those, we're not conducting business, right? That's. You're not conducting business for sure. You're very vague. I'm just trying to get you to nail it down. Here. <laughs> mainly, it's not vague. Not vague. vague. Mainly, it's not reply vague. all. I mean, if you need to reply Alan, you can do yeah. that. Right. If he sends you an email, you've got questions about it. You you reply to Dr. Markley personally, or, or to Rachel, whoever it may be. That's that's perfectly acceptable. To to reply all and to start a discussion about a particular issue in that email between the group is not. I had a question though. Um, is it, do you recommend us using our school email address or our personal email address, or does it make a difference? Yeah, it doesn't make one bit of difference. Because both are subject to subpoena. That's correct. So what if I have a private server in my basement at home? <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. 
But I would guess, I mean, I've said, oh, I'm going to start using my school email, but I haven't. Because while I may not be, I may not want to have things on my personal email shared, but how far back does, how far back does it, if someone subpoenaed our emails, how far back do they ask for it? With a sunshine Again. violation? Mm -hmm. It's, there's a statute of limitations, I, I'm going to have to look at the sunshine to see what it is. It's, I can't remember if it's two or three, uh, but with, they're they're going to go back as as far as that statute of limitations. <coughs> um, and again, years. Uh, years. Yeah. yeah. But the the nature, or pardon me, the the account that it comes from, if you're conducting public business assignment. Okay. We have we have many school district clients again that are small that, that don't have school emails they conduct mm -hmm. everything by way of mm -hmm. uh, personal email or, or text so whatever. When I went to the, a workshop at the um, conference in June, Scott Summers did the workshop, and he was talking about the question of what are emergencies for emergency meetings. What is an emergency? And he, okay, he gave a great example of um, after the Joplin tornado, sure. board met out in the wreckage sure. and they took notes on a two by four so that's obviously an emergency but do you have a do you have parameters about what is an emergency for a meeting if we're talking about the health welfare and safety of your students or staff members of, of district okay. um, of the district I, I think that's going to be easily justified as, a, as an emergency I don't think there's a, a per se definition of that Ms. Tittle but okay. That, and we certainly have that all the time where we have information that becomes available and we have to amend agendas. It's, it's possible to do those things mm -hmm. uh, as we roll into our meetings, but uh, for it to be an emergency, I would think it's going to be something that if we don't address it now, uh, it's, it's got the ability to, to negatively impact our district operations in a major way or, or the health and safety of our students. Mm -hmm. That's good. All right, I appreciate that. Yep. Does thank anybody else have any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan. Let's talk about board goals. Okay. All right. Uh, on ESB, there's some items there, and you can click on these. I said something to you a couple weeks ago. Or let me back up here. You've got your the board goals of 2018-2019, the list of one through eight. Uh, you have a curriculum summit document that kind of gives you some of the uh, professional development uh, opportunities that we had over the summer for our staff. And I think Ms. Tittle may have attended one of those, one or yes. two of those. Um, the superintendent goals is something that I sent to you uh, a week ago Friday. And the goals presentation in September, which we're going to queue up here, is a part of that but with some additional things and with some timelines and with some more focus uh, that I want to talk about tonight. So go ahead. Uh, you're driving this thing, Kevin? Okay, thank you. What we're going to talk a little bit about tonight is briefly review our board goals and some of the progress on that. Uh, look at some goals for the, the, the interim of 2019-2020 and then 1920 and beyond uh, where we think we'd like to go in discussions. I will tell you that discussions I've had with staff, the discussions that we've had in here, uh, the board goals that we currently have in place um, are all a part of these things. Um, the end goal I think would be is to try and decide on a set of goals by the October meeting. And we'll also throw in, I had three goals sent to me by board members. Mr. Cody, you had a couple, I believe, and uh, Mr. Moore had one as well. Um, I will say that the goals that you see that I go through can all be linked back to the eight goals that are already in place. So they're not so much board goals, but goals that I'm trying to set for the administration and the rest of the district to satisfy more goals at the end of the day. Knowing that a lot of these things, as we go through them, there's going to be a great amount of time and research and communication and feedback from staff and members of the community uh, to see that these are something they want to do. For example, you're going to see tonight 
um, changing high school start times. But that may not sound like a big deal. It's a huge deal to do that. But we also know what the research says about kids going to school later that are in grades 9 through 12 and what it does for them academically. And we need to go down the road and see if we can get there. But that, that is a big move, uh, primarily because of transportation issues, since we're on a forward route system, I see Travis back there nodding his head, uh, of switching things around. But we think we might be able to do something. We're going to try. Uh, but we've got to have feedback from the community and not only just our high school folks, but by changing the high school times, you're going to have to change somebody else's time. Right. Uh, so we'll need feedback from everybody there. But that's just an example of what it's going to take uh, as far as that goes. Inside all of these individual goals that I'm going to be presenting to you, the themes of those are instructional leadership, curriculum instructions, and curriculum and instructions, facilities and operations, and then the culture and climate of our schools uh, in our, our school community. That's things you will not see that we're already working on and they're not necessarily goals, it's just something that we are doing. And that is expanding mental health opportunities for our kids in the district through partnerships with people like Cerner and grants for more social workers through the grant writer that we have, we have uh, employed, but also the different medical services that we offer kids. Uh, like score one for health, the smiles program, vision that kids aren't getting. You know, those might be goals, but I didn't mention those because we're already doing it. Okay? We're, those are the things that we do. And a lot of times we just do these things. We just we don't necessarily make them a goal. We see the need and we do it. Okay. Um, so any questions on that? That's how I want to approach this and roll into this. Now I'll briefly talk about go ahead, Kevin. Um, you see the goals on there, I'm not going to read them to you, uh, but as you get down to uh, the slide, more goals 2018-2019, keep going Kevin, one more. I'm breaking it down by the goals as far as meter exceeds student academic growth. Um, we're going to spend some time here on this goal in November, primarily because we don't have all of our academic progress numbers back yet. Uh, the APR won't go to the public till next month. Um, we're still cleaning up some data in some testing areas. Um, this isn't something new for this board. How many years have we been doing that? The fourth, fourth new test in five years over three different new sets of standards. Okay, we're finally getting away from that. And MSIP 6 will get us there. Okay, so be thinking about in the back of your, not, your mind, our academic goals that we're setting tonight, or going, that we're setting for ourselves for this school year, are going to have to change a little bit when MSIP 6 comes in because the rubric for scoring is going to be changing. So we'll want to reflect our scoring uh, goals of, as far as what that requires us to do or where we think we can be. Um, the second goal is ensuring that school community is welcome and valued. Um, the different advisory committees that we have, anywhere from the Herndon Advisory Committee that I know Brian's on, parents, and certain industrial uh, partners that we have. Citizens Advisory, Safety Task Force, Teacher Advisory Committee. We have a number of advisory committees that bring folks in. The last few years we've been doing some parental surveys at our parent-teacher conferences and want to continue to do that and ramp those up and seeing what our parents and families think of how we can improve our schools and the services that we provide. Uh, the district communications piece of that, patron updates, the CT, C2 view, the peach jar uh, announcements, social media, uh, and that comes all of that comes out of Danielle's department. She does a great job of uh, getting that out to patrons. And then we mentioned a little bit on professional development for staff. Um, really our big push is helping our staff understand the cultural competency of, of our community. Uh, and we're continuing to do that, pushing that out. Dennis is shaking his head because he's probably sit through uh, some of those, those presentations. Okay, <laughs> So we'll continue to do that as well. So, and this is just kind of a recap. I'm not telling you anything that you haven't seen or haven't provided for you. But item three, um, this is one you're going to see um, some pushes for from me uh, in trying to get this accomplished. But utilize and establish hiring guidelines and best practices to continue to attract and retain staff. There is a teacher shortage. You've seen it in the news. We know it. We have seen it. We have goals to attract and retain teachers. Um, and, and not only just teachers, but also teachers of, uh, of minority status, and we're just not getting there. We're just, we've tried to grow your own, uh, we've tried the recruitment fairs, uh, 
we're going to have to do something else. And there's something in here I want to talk about that I think can help not only Raytown, but also the region uh, if we can make it happen. Okay. Um, item number four speaks to that as far as you see that um, chart there. You can see where we, we ended up, and this is something that you've seen before. We've met every area except for the certified staff on meeting that 20% minority certified new uh, hires. And this is uh, the 18-19 school year, as you can see. Um, again, we know the reason why. We know the candidates are just not there for us to capture. But that's not an excuse, and, and we're looking for ways to, to um, improve that. Grow Your Own, obviously, was one. We've made a hard push with UCM and U, UMKC to capture more and more of their student teachers and bringing them into our district and try to address uh, some of these things. Um, item five is the, is the rate team survey. You can see what was done last year. Item six, several different things that we do to assure that children and staff are in a safe environment. I will say um, this district is, is far ahead uh, and as far as most districts go, providing a safe and working environment for their employees uh, and their students. It's, it's really, we are, I wouldn't say we are a national model, but we are referenced a lot in this state about the lengths that we go to to provide a safe learning environment. So, item number seven, uh, as far as the technology side of things, we do have a one-to-one -one program, uh, two through 12, and K through one is a one-to-two program. Something we did new this year was giving uh, graduating seniors uh, their devices as they left because we were cycling them out as we were replacing new. Uh, we've been improving the technology infrastructure. One thing I think we need to uh, do a better job of is continue working on app or educating our parents on our systems, our SysK-12, and how to use those and how those communicate. And that'll be a part of the process moving forward. Item 8 is something we can all be proud of. Um, as far as the expansion of preschool education in this in this district, uh, coming out of a, a recommendation from the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, and providing more preschool spots, free preschool for our students, we are at the point today where we are now a full day. Uh, we have over 400 kids uh, combined in new trails and three trails uh, providing preschool. Not all those are. Some of those are uh, early childhood special education kids. Uh, several are Title I kids. Some are just a conglomeration. Some are Head Start kids. But we're getting more kids in there. Now, we did see a little bit of a decrease because we, have, we went to full day. Okay? But we will continue to grow. I'm not saying we didn't see a decrease in enrollment. Uh, we're full, spots-wise. So we need to look ahead of how we can increase more, more spots and more space. And we'll be doing that as well. Okay. And then the next slide, um, I'd like Mr. Toady and Mr. Moore, if they don't mind, to speak to the goals that you, if you want to speak to the goals to the board uh, and offering these up. So before, everyone wants to go first. Well, I'll go first. Mine's easy because we, the board voted on this many years ago to do this. And I know there's things standing in our way to it being done. We need to, we need to find a way to get it done, whether that's lobby legislators to help us, whether that's at the federal or state level, we need, to, we need to do something to figure out how to get this done. Because other districts have it, and their students have advantages by having this that ours don't have. So we got to figure out a way to get this. Now speaking to, and I agree with you, and speaking to those advantages, and I'll be able to skip it because it's in part of my presentation, and a little bit further down the line. Uh, and doing the research on the, the advantages of ROTC programs, first and foremost, if you're in an ROTC program, and a lot of people don't realize this, you do not have to join the military service after you leave high school. That's not a requirement, okay? Even to, you know, even to receive a scholarship into a college uh, that might have ROTC, and I'm not talking West Point or any of the others. So you could go into college ROTC, and I, I still don't think you have to you have to go into military service. But the advantages are the leadership skills that it gives kids, uh, the different scholarship opportunities that they might have. To have that instance rather than we have a lot of kids go into the military um, after high school, but they're just going right in the military, going into boot camp, and they are private first class or whatever it may be, uh, third class. Thank you, um, and. 
But a lot of times, these kids that go into ROTC can walk out, and their lifestyle is a little bit different than high school. There's some days where they wear the uniforms. There's certain things that they they do, and, and I'm not an expert in, in the ROTC program, but when they walk out of high school, uh, they do have an ability to go into a little, maybe a little higher ranking um, as far as where they might go in the military. So the leadership skills it, it creates, the citizenship skills that it creates, is, is worth <coughs> the, certainly looking into getting a program such as this. So. What are the things that hinder? Rick, you said uh, there were other schools, districts? Yeah, other, they some has it, uh, Blue Springs had it. And what Ryan, you want to talk about what's... The question the camera. Yeah. Uh, we, we've been on the Air Force list for 10 years or more. Uh, we started out around school 200 and they just, you know, grant to, you know, ROTC programs that worked on the list. We're at number 20 or so right now. Uh, they're not granting any new programs for the last two years and do not plan on granting a new program this year. Um, we have checked into other service organizations, you know, other services. We could go into the Navy or the Army or the Marines, but we would be number 200 on our list. They're all the same length of lists. The, the only person who has really been able to move that has been Colin Powell, who opened up the you know, pocketbooks and was able to jump that list a little bit one year, but there just isn't the money right now. But all is not lost. We do have hope. There are some options other than a traditional ROTC program, um, particularly through the Naval Department, that we want to look into. Provides the same benefits, um, similar type of programs. We need to do more investing. the Navy's the best one. <laughs> well, some of the <laughs> Naval man would say that. But it's something that we want to research and bring back to this body to potentially implement. And well, have we done any contact, not that they could, but with Cleaver or Blunt or Holly at the federal level, see if they can help us? That's something, we're going, higher. That's something we're going to try and see if we can't get somewhere. Matter of fact, uh, MSBA has a strong relationship with Senator Blunt, uh, and we may try that angle of when we're members of MSBA and see if we can at least get a meeting with Senator Blunt or something okay. along those lines and lobby for that. But knowing that that's a, that's a hard sell or a hard push, that we have plan B that we can fall back on and still gives the same benefits possible. It doesn't, and I haven't done that detailed work to find why, so I'll leave it to you guys, but with all the recruiting issues that they have, just like everybody else trying to hire people for jobs, because that's a job when it comes right down to it, not at this level, but still, I, I don't know why they're not wanting to expand the programs when it would just help them also. It's, it's funding. It's pretty funding. It's funding. That's right. But the, uh, the other route is promising. We will, we will pursue everything we can right. to make this work. Well, the, the second one, I'll, we've already talked about that, about uh, videoing the meetings. So I'll just spend a few seconds and minutes on the first one. And the and, um, uh, best example is uh, we have violated, I mean, I said, the Lawson uh, and Lee Summit um, uh, budget uh, presentations to uh, the administration, and they are outstanding. Um, they, uh, you don't have to be a, a, a CPA to, to understand where those districts are going, where they've been, and where, where they're headed. They're terrific. And so it, from the standpoint of transparency, it speaks volumes. It really does. I mean, you, you've seen them shaking your head, and I appreciate that. They, but the other point that is is also it's a marketing point. It gets your message out, okay? And and we have, as you well know, that Cerner Building. There are people that are buying homes, and my kids, uh, my son works for Cerner. He knows hundreds of them that would entertain, perhaps at some point, living in the Raytown School District, and. They are, they are really picky shoppers when it comes to schools. And, and so the benefit of having these sophisticated documents will provide the non-financial and the financial uh, information to help some of these highly intelligent people make a decision to whether or not to send our, their kids here or send them down the road to Lee Summit or up north. Because uh, we, have, we have 
we've got a lot of houses that are going to go for sale, and we have a good we have a good message, and we've got to be able to cater at least at some point to some of the buyers that um, don't have the message. So I'm I'm. It, it could take some work. It could take some. It, the the initial front end load takes some time. The maintenance is not as right. uh, that. But I think we also have to butter, but you know, uh, backstop that against what resources do we do we have to devote to it. I had another item, but does anybody else have anything they want to? I sent something out there too because I talk about it all the time. I wanted to codify somehow the issue of how we get more of our employees living in the district and by somehow incentivizing that. It's in my list. Okay. It's in my list. Okay. I did have a comment on some of the things that were on there. I don't I didn't have nothing new to add, I don't think. <laughs> it just seems to me that from the previous goals, goal number one and two I don't, outside of stating something more specific about how much, what that uh, growth would be in a year, whatever time period, uh, I think that would make it a better goal, something measurable. Um, I don't know how you measure, number two. Um, I would even suggest that those are not goals. That's who we are, and uh, that's our purpose. And all those other goals are supporting that. Those two things. And so um, it'd be more like a vision or a mission or a statement. And those goals support all the other goals. Support those things. I would say. To, to that, and I don't disagree with you at all. I think that's you know, the first one is the is probably the one that we can show uh, more of the data and the progress to uh, because of the test data that we get, or the you know from the test data, the graduation data to the vocational completers, a lot of those things, which we're going to talk a little bit about in here. And again, that's all going to change a little bit once MSIP six comes to comes to uh, fruition, but that may be something the board considers as far as, you know, we, we changed, it was such a moving target for us uh, 10 years ago uh, as far as chasing that percentage, that number, are you at, remember when you were on the board the last time, Mr. Toady, it was a 12 or a 14, or are you a 9, or are you an 8? When I, after that, it went to a percentage, were you an 86, or are you a 94, or are you a 70? This year, the department's not even going to publish a number. They're either going to say you're accredited, you're provisionally accredited, or you're unaccredited. That's all they're going to publish. So you can see how that's evolutionized over time where the number was important and then the testing all changed and we never really knew and the, the department started massaging the annual performance report, particularly in the test scores and how they were calculated because they were giving us a new test every year, and MSIP 5 is officially broken. I mean, it is broken because it's been, it's, it's just been amended so many times to meet whatever needs to be met. That's why MSIP 6 will finally give us something to shoot for again uh, that we can really measure ourselves against. So that may be a consideration that we take in, as far as number one, you may, however you want to reword that, I agree with you. It sounds more like a mission statement than it does maybe a goal, because our goal should be to, to be accredited. But there's a lot more things that come into that accredit being called accredited. Why are you accredited, et cetera. So be thinking about that. And, and I would ask this body to think about how would you reword it? How would you, could it be reworded a different way and move itself out of a mission or a vision into a more sustainable goal? And to be frank, Maybe it leaves until we have an idea of what MSIP 6 is. And then maybe we can properly create a goal that satisfies that. Okay. I'm kind of along those lines. 
Uh, the board goal eight where it's expand district preschool education to include the educational needs of students from birth to age four. <coughs> Going along with your goal of having adult education, I'd like to see that incorporated together, kind of like a, uh, you know, a goal of lifelong learning from birth to adult um, would be a, a good way to tie birth that. Birth to adult or birth to adult, adult, adult. <laughs> I, I would my, hate to put an age on I understand. it and show I age discrimination. I don't want to agree that. Earth to I sea. mean, some of us are younger than others, so I mean. Oh, okay, just... that really hurts. <laughs> Earth to senior discount. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get the discount. Well, when we talk about what I'm going to talk a little bit about when we get to that adult education, that's more of a permanent thing. Um, and what we might do there, I see you smiling back there, Mr. Wise. But uh, but you're not you're not referring to that. You're talking more of a birth to age 18. I mean, once you leave <coughs> as a senior, or are you talking about post secondary? Post secondary. Okay. okay. I mean, if that's something that we're going to work on. And okay. So you would want that included some way in eight. Yes. Or um, the goal could be where it is. But I still you're probably still going to have to rewrite the goal if you want to include the post secondary piece. Or maybe it becomes its own. Maybe. Are you if, talking if about the old aid or the new aid? Are you still going to finish going through your part of the Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, we're still got some way to go around. So. He's not done talking no. yet. No. I've got some things that we could be excited about. Sorry. Referring back to number two, I would like to keep it on there. And if when M6, M6 SIP 6 comes out, then if it needs to be revised, then let's look at it then. But I, I wanted to hold it spot. I, I wasn't trying to say take any of them off. No, I didn't take yeah. that okay. then. Okay. I just want to make sure that I pointed that out. On the instructional leadership side, uh, beginning with that, there will be a few slides referencing these. Uh, we do on-site school observations all the time, uh, from the ELT members to the SLT all the way down to building principals. We're going to continue to do that. But a more important, I think, uh, something that Brian's team will work on designing and, and centering it around the MSIP 6 um, process is a principal leadership institute for our principals and specifically looking at MSIP 6 and how to navigate it and how to institute it and how to be successful with it. Um, that's something that will take us some time to design, but I think what it will do for us is help our administrators, one, get them buy into the process of promoting MSIP 6 into their building because anytime this is 6, I've been through 2, 3, 4, 5 of these things, okay, um, it's not always well perceived in the building. And we need the buy-in from all folks, and I think it start with training our, we've trained our principals before uh, in different leadership academies and things, but this is something we want to be really good at. We want to be really good at this because it will allow us to be good at so many different things if we are good at this. So I think a leadership institute for our principals uh, and, and helping them set goals in their buildings based on these things. Um, it might be something I put on there, expand the module regionally, we would be willing to do that. You're always careful when you do that because when you train people up, people take them, but it'll be the benefit of our kids and benefit of our staff. Um, and by the way, we have been waiting, MSIP 6 should have occurred almost three years ago. Um, and we're wait, still waiting, so it's coming. Uh, the second side of things is increase and expand professional learning offerings to instructional leadership. Um, I'd like to see us, <coughs> this talks to goal number one, uh, Mr. Burton, as far as where right now, this next year, we want to ex expand uh, and improve our proficient advanced percentage of students scoring in uh, three through five or three through eight math and EOCs, three to five percent. Uh, again, I put in parentheses there. M6 models, that's going to, we'll know what that change hopefully will be by spring of 2020. But the more interim and recent goal, that's where we're at in all subgroups that we have. Not only to, we're talking about district wide, building wide, uh, each building will have that goal 
uh, to get those kids in proficient and advanced. Uh, any question in that? And that's, that's where we want to start. And again, that's going to change uh, once we see what the MSIP 6 scoring rubric will be. Okay? We'll have a new start. We'll have a new, we'll have a new number of kids. That, here's where they're at. Then we'll set our growth model to that. But that's where we want to be at this time. Um, increase the number of students enrolling in advanced placement courses, classes. Uh, you can see the numbers that we have there. In 16, 17, we had a high number, uh, generally because we had a higher number of kids in high school at that point. But as far as it dropping to 83 to 87, um, we'd like to increase that 10% annually. But knowing that's a double-edged double -edged sword specifically for dual credit. You get kids taking dual credit, you get them taking AP, a lot of times you're going to take one or the other because there is a cost. Okay, And if we have to sacrifice one, I would sacrifice the AP side of things because student, students, I see you shaking your head, Mr. Burton, you probably know why, students have to score a certain score in there to receive credit for it. If they take the dual credit class and can pass the class, they're going to get the credit from the corresponding university, the money that they spent. Um, that might be perhaps why some of the students have stopped because we've had the foundation offering uh, to pay a portion of dual credit courses uh, for some of our students uh, that are on free and relief status, etc. So uh, a timeline for that, um, that's ongoing today and moving on, increasing that. But if we're going to promote it, it's the dual credit side of things that we want to do and that leads into my next slide. Um, we have Center for Advanced Professional Studies on the Southland side. We've been in business for that now for two and a half years, three years, about well, three years. Um, we started this with uh, with Raymore Peculiar, more of a, they were an anchor with us. Uh, Hickman was an anchor with us. Uh, Belton is, is on there with us at times. Lee Summit has joined the crew. Um, we want to grow it. What I miss? Center. Well, Center is kind of waffling a little bit too at times, but um, we want to grow up. The Northland CAPS program has several <coughs> districts involved with it, um, and we, we don't have the ability to join. That's why we started the Southland CAPS, and now we have the different strands of animal science, teaching and learning, technology, etc. Uh, we want to grow it. Okay? Uh, my goal this year would be to bring Center, Fort Osage, and Grand Union uh, to the fold. Um, but by doing so, we're going to have to change our governance model. Our governance model right now is that we run it, okay? That's that we run, we are the fiscal, we could be the fiscal agent for it, but we're also running it, yet we have these districts that are involved. Uh, sure, they have input, they have say, but there's not really a board of directors. This is the board of directors for Southland Caps right here as we bring everything to you to be approved. The model to the north is the districts that are members, they have one member on the board of directors, and there's someone that they are overseeing and they make the decisions, and I think that's the way we need to go. Um, we could still be the fiscal agent for it, uh, receiving the tuition dollars, etc. But we need to, if we want to grow it, I think we need to, to turn that over. But with that being said, um, I talked to you about another method of the teacher shortage, which is becoming a, a not just a regional problem, but it's a, it's a national problem. We have a teaching strand in there for kids to go into the teaching field. And I think we can we can capture, if we can expand this, and I've got Center and Fort Osage and Grandview on there, but next year I have three more. And the next year I have three more. And branching out all the way down to Archie, uh, Missouri, and as far west uh, as potentially Warrensburg. So if we can grow that, more kids that we get in there, maybe the more kids we get into that teaching stream, okay, that would be if I was going to have one of the outcomes, that would be one. Uh, the other, more kids in. Because eventually I think this, what could happen is we grow, uh, the Northland and Southland might come together and we would have a region, regional uh, capstone program like they do in Southwest Missouri where Springfield is the hub, but they branched out to all the, the local school districts out that want to join. So, any questions on that? Now, a part of that caveat, as far as CAPS, I think as a, as, a, uh, as a group, we'll have more power or maybe some more influence. You can see our numbers of dual credit 
uh, where they've gone from 668, 717 to 548. The goal uh, for the next school year would have at least 600 uh, students uh, in some type of dual credit class uh, for 21 22. Um, we need to look at a possible partnership through CAPS with the university, whether it's UMKC, whether it's UM, uh, UCM, to offer dual credit op free dual credit opportunities for students that qualify for free and reduced lunch. Currently, we could walk, we could call up Missouri State and they would do that for us for our district. Um, but UCM is right next door and it's such a, a, better, a closer partnership for our kids might funnel from here to there. Same way with the district center and caps. But that's one thing that we're going to investigate and try to get completed this year. But, um, when you have on here the number of students enrolling in dual credit classes and it says like for what, 2019, 548. Is that 548 individual students, or is that 548 seats in the class? Because like seats there's some class. that seats in, seats in the class. class. Count twice, or okay. three times, or four times. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You could have a kid taking three or four, as you know, because I think probably he you have some yeah, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> hey. Okay. Is uh, GPA for the um, advanced placement? This, this is that higher to get a more credit, right? I think that's correct. But are you talking about our GPA, like for yeah. the district? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it's weighted. But so are dual weighted. credit courses. Yeah, dual credits are. They're both weighted. Uh, they both are. Uh -huh. And so are all Hurley classes and all Summit Tech classes. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> so, uh, what? So you said Missouri State right now will do that? They would. If we called up Missouri State, we could get our students that qualify for free and reduced free dual credit. So why classes. don't we do that again? Because the kids don't care. Well, they don't care, but we need. We may end up doing it if UCM. It's you know we might be able to get that done for the next semester, but we'd like to do it in a bigger group setting. The idea would be to get them to a university. With, well, yeah, they don't care, but. We want to see where UCM stands on it and UMKC. But, what but all those classes, are, most of them are all going to be transferable anyway. So. They are. But of course, one of the advantages is um, we're also trying to pave the way. We have, we have two goals here. One is to, to garner more college credit. Another is to pave the way for them to go to college. And so they actually, our dual credit kids, actually enroll in the college. So they're actually enrolled in UMKC or they're enrolled in UCM. Or both. And it, Right. And, and so it paves the way very nicely for them to go to UCM. UCM is a fabulous partner for us, and we want to give them the chance to get to do this as well. Freddie is more good. fabulous. Exactly. <laughs> Missouri State has only recently done this. Yeah. And so we, we, we would like to jump on board. They're a partner with a couple districts in the metro. I, I would be surprised if they don't get a whole lot more if the other local dis, uh, universities don't jump on board and do the same thing. Okay. Increased student scores on our ACT, you can see in 2016 we were at 18.3 and 18 down to 17.6. Um, you know, part of the declines are reflective to, uh, you can remember when the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education made all juniors begin taking the ACT. So it flooded the number and drove the numbers down. We've since kind of leveled off, um, but we're still not where we want to be. Uh, we're setting a goal for this year to raise that composite score of 0.02 to 0.08 percent in that range, but we need to do a better job probably of ACT prep. Um, we need to hopefully as we get these dual credit classes and things online and get our kids taking them uh, and being successful in them, they'll be more successful on the ACT. But we know there's more that we can do if we, if we can get kids to attend the dual credit work or the ACT workshops and be committed to it, we think we can do a better job uh, in the final result. Increase the number of students attending the Herndon Career Center. Uh, you can see where that number has gone up significantly um, over the low. years. That's low. It's well, actually 508. So it's yeah, it's okay. These are these were the hottest numbers we had two weeks ago that, that I, I mean, had I my hands it. on. So, <laughs> but uh, but 
we know that, uh, and Brian's here, but also um, the other instructors over there have strong partnerships with the trade unions. Uh, but there's ways we can enhance those. Um, what those ways are, that's what I'm going to, the information I'll be getting back from uh, my folks at Herndon, how we can do that, how we can maybe cut down some of the barriers that are there, the stigmas for kids, etc., on what it means to be, you know, entering, that, entering a vocational workforce. Um, one thing we're going to talk about in October. Kansas City Fire Department. That's right. The uh, partnership with the Kansas City Fire Department. Kim, you want to speak to that? Sure. We are, um, Kansas City Fire Department has had um, an agreement with the Kansas City Public Schools. And what they've done is through their career center, they have a EMT program. And through the students that are attending KCMO that go through their EMT, uh, course and program, at the end of the course, you take a national exam. They've had zero kids be able to pass it, and therefore this partnership that they're working on with Kansas City Fire Department hasn't been able to be implemented. Because what Kansas City Fire Department has said is that if the students that live in Kansas City, Missouri addresses, so they need KCMO um, students' addresses, if you live in that particular uh, zip code and area, then what Kansas City Fire Department will do will take you on as an apprentice student. And you can, once you graduate from high school, go into their apprentice program um, up to two years, which could lead you to uh, being a fire firefighter, actually. They take them through the EMT process and then even to uh, become a firefighter. They have approached us because we had such a high rate of students passing that national exam and approached us to say, would you consider partnering with us? And students that have the KCMO address that live in Raytown or even any of our school districts that are attending in our EMT uh, program that have a KCMO address could go into this apprentice program and potentially be employed by the Kansas City Fire Department without, you know, a college degree. They're going to go a non-traditional route through their own training program, which would be fully paid by the Kansas City Fire Department. And so uh, we are working on the agreement. We hope to have that. With, we're on the final um, works of it, but it's a it's a really great opportunity and. We hope that at the October board meeting, we will bring forward the agreement and hopefully one of their representatives um, can join us and just share the plans. But really, um, that, that our kids would have an opportunity to join this apprentice program at the end of this school year. And that's just an example of some of the partnerships that we want to investigate where we can follow our kids straight out of our Herndon uh, program into uh, a vocation. Um, you see an increase in graduation rate. You can see we have four, five, six, and seven years. Now that's what that is. You know, you think, well, it took the kids seven years to graduate. And yeah, yes, it does at times. Uh, you can see our four-year graduation rate in 19 was 83.9, which was down a little bit from 18, but it, our five-year was up. And this is pretty normal for us, uh, I would say. But this is could likely change also in the MSIP 6 model uh, and how it's calculated. Um, student attendance, you can see where we fluctuate on attendance as well. We're at 93.49, we want to be at 95, but I will tell you our, uh, even though we have fluctuated down a little bit, our 90 by 90, you've heard us say that in here, meaning 90% of our kids are here 90% of the time. That is actually ticked up, particularly at our high schools, uh, which was the goal. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, one way to possibly attack this attendance piece is changing this high school schedule. And that's going to take some, some uh, heavy work, as I said before, but it's something that we want to look into. This is something that would go to the Citizens Advisory Committee and, and, and really vet this thing out to, to see if this is a viable option for us because it's going to have to include the, include the discussion of transportation and food service, etc. Um, as far as exactly uh, a, a big reason that, that districts you know there's not a metro district 
uh, that's in the Suburban Conference that, that has a late start high school because of the extracurricular activities that are occurring after school. Um, so it would have to be a change for some of us uh, on some different things. It doesn't affect varsity. Also think about the uh, jobs, etc., things like that that kids have. Particularly a lot of our kids work um, after school and some before. So it's something we'll have to to vet and something that, you know, a timeline there, 22 to 23 school year, uh, might be the latest, it might be sooner, depending on where we can get. All right, go ahead, Kevin. This was something that was brought up in a recent meeting about how about getting our classroom teacher student ratios down to the desirable level and what it would take to do so. And you can see where I had listed on there, that's the desirable levels that are provided by Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, K2. 17 kids per class, 3, 4, 12, 5, 6, 22, 7, 12, 25. We're not at that. Uh, we're more at the minimum side. Um, and as you get into high school, some classes are, are large. Um, but this is something we want to look at, and we're going to bring you a cost of what it would be uh, to get there. And that's something we think we can do probably this year to at least give the cost. Now, implementing it, maybe not. Uh, but we can also probably show you, we'll be able to show you the research of the benefits or the non-benefits of getting there. Uh, I put middle school on there uh, because if you look at some of our academic uh, data, that we struggle a little bit in middle school, particularly in the sixth grade. Um, you can remember a time when we did some budget uh, cuts. Uh, it's been four or five years ago. We got rid of the teaming concept in middle school. Um, and we've noticed over the past few years that our middle school scores aren't necessary. That's not the only thing that might be contributing to that. But we've noticed our middle school scores aren't where they necessarily should be or where we want them to be. Um, so I think we need to talk about the concept again of a fifth, sixth grade center. And I don't walk out of here because the last time I said we were going to talk about a fifth, sixth grade center, immediately the middle school teachers thought we were going to a fifth, sixth grade center. That's not the case. But we need to have the discussion of what that would be. And that may work into all this. We've had a conversation in finance committees, and et cetera, about as decline in enrollment occurs, it may be a possible school consolidation along the line of how we move. Can we move, can we move kids, elementary kids, into other district schools, maintain the desirable or the minimum standards, uh, and still and be able to save a site for something else or not at all? And that's something I think we need to talk about particularly because uh, of our declining rate. Um, decrease in OSS and ISS rate. We've talked about the reducing the long-term OSS and alternatives to OSS, and we have recommendations to the CAC, and we need to start implementing some of those, and that's our intention to do so, um, some of those things. The next one may be a big lift as well. Year-round elementary school. Now, I'm not saying year-round for 10 elementary schools, but um, this is not something new. Our neighbors to the north in North Kansas City have two, uh, and they've had them for mm, maybe three years, three or four years, and, and they're seeing some results. Now, we've tried to, we haven't gone to the extent of year-round, even though it may feel year-round, because when you combine summer school and then the summer learning academy that we included in that for our kids that were uh, two, two grades or more behind or grade and a half behind in math or English, uh, we invited them to the summer learning academy session. Um, why aren't we continuing to do that? Well, you've seen the reports that Dr. Mixon has given. You know, attendance, the number of kids that we could have there, we might get half of them to attend. We don't really have anything to hold, hold them accountable as far as you will come or you don't necessarily go to the next grade. We don't do that. Um, but we have an issue with, with some of our and some of our buildings. So we want to investigate the potential year-round elementary school for one of our buildings. Um, now that's going to take some time uh, because there are a lot of things that will have to occur for that to happen. Again, transportation, uh, options for parents that are living in that uh, attendance zone to attend another elementary if they don't want their child to go to a full-year elementary school. If I'm a school that what school would we be choosing? What do you think we'd, we'd be looking at? Would we be looking at a building uh, that had high uh, proficiency, high uh, 
meets proficiency or advanced. No, we're looking for that building that's higher on the, on the other end uh, and trying to make a difference in that building. So we're going to look at that and see what, what that looks like uh, and vet that. That's another thing that would need to go to the Citizens Advisory Committee and probably need to go into some public forums uh, for parents to, to ask questions, etc. And then Mr. Moore's comment there on the uh, ROTC programs, and we'll be looking into, into that as well. Under facilities and operations, obviously completing the 19 bond projects. Next month, we're going to have a discussion about the South High Auditorium and gymna slash gymnasium. We think we may have found some opportunities to where we can do something over there. We know we have that issue with the, uh, the walls that have moved, and we've put systems in place to provide uh, a safe environment. But we know that is just a temporary fix. Uh, we think we found some avenues potentially within our own budget to the bond issue that we have before us that we may be able to get something done. We're going to sit down with the board and that's an immediate thing we want to get to. We're going to ask uh, Dr. Hux's department to look at natural gas transportation and potential savings that are there. We're not the only district, we wouldn't be the only district around that would have natural gas, uh, but with the continued cuts in school transportation uh, by the state, um, and we've looked at contracted transportation before. Uh, we knew that wasn't for us because there were really no cost savings for it. So we want to look at some other options. <laughs> and then also begin that work on that bond issue in 2025, uh, which is Mr. Bertner uh, alluded to that there's $200 million in needs uh, 2025 based on the financial abilities for us to do something. And ending uh, the bond issue that we have here would be about the next time that something might go to the ballot to be approved, and we'll talk about those. Um, culture and climate, I mentioned surveying staff, working conditions for staff, talking to students about necessary improvements, um, and then the competitive salary schedule, um, and be right there in the middle or somewhere towards the top of the metropolitan school districts, uh, and that's a rate team issue, and we look forward to them giving us their recommendations on that. And then finally, um, incentive for staff living in the school district. Uh, a good friend of mine and I sit down one day in his office several years ago, his name is Brian Blankenship, and we talked about this incentive of how do we get folks to, to live, our staff to move to Raytown. And Brian and I are from areas where they had career ladder systems. Okay, and Amy, did El Dorado have a career ladder there in uh, Cedar County? No. Okay. Not when I was there, they did later. Right. Uh, to give you an idea what the career ladder system was, and I'm not saying this would work for us, but career ladder was a system that was created uh, by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and funded by the legislature to help small school districts that had smaller salary schedules than some of the bigger school districts get that physics teacher or get that chemistry teacher, get that hard to reach teacher because they would offer additional dollars to them on top of the salary schedule based on their years experience and also to keep experienced teachers career ladder in those small districts and from my memory and some of it's still out there is uh, if you're if you had one to five years teaching experience you got fifteen hundred dollars if it was six to ten you got three thousand if it was eleven plus you got five thousand and that was given to you each year on top of what your were on the salary schedule for the district um, that's something we're going to look into for staff. What that's going to look like at the end of the day, um, you know, we have incentives as far as in our work incentives, we provide good health benefits, a competitive salary for the most part. Um, we have a great wellness program, those kind of things, but at the end of the day, um, people move for money. I mean, they do. And we're going to see, you know, this, we're just going to take a shot at it and see what it looks like and see if we can do it and see what it, what it looks like. But that's kind of the framework that we work around is that year's experience and, and what's that mean. And I don't think you just talk about certified, you also talk about support staff at the same time uh, that are living here. And then uh, the ending one here is a cultural competency discussion with our community, continue to have parent forums. Dr. Huff and Dr. Uh, Moore continue to lead those um, with staff and with community. And we're going to continue to do that and try to create the awareness that we want. So that's just the start. There will be more.
So this this is uh, <clears throat> the most discussion we've had about board goals in many years, and that was one of my goals is to not just put 1920 on last year and call it the deal. So this is good. I like all this. Good discussion. <clears throat> really, the only thing now is how to get all that second part into rewording what we need to do on the first part. And into the list. Like I said before, all these things that I went through rather quickly with you, um, that's more of a, almost like the worker bee stuff. Would you agree? That we want to try to get, yeah, I mean, it's more of the, how, how we're going to achieve it. You know, we may have a, a saying up here what the goals will be, but these are the things that are filling in. Um, you know, we've done some things over the years. You can remember what our goal was. You know, we need to do something investigate a health clinic you know for staff and we got there and got a little bit more out of it at the same time um, but it really we can write the goals and then we're going to do the work you know you can see the long looks on their faces over there that this is where the work is going to <laughs> begin um, over here but um, you know what do we want our document to look like do we even need exactly. need a document that's up to I think you have to have something. I, you know, student achievement is at the top of the list. Okay, um, you've got um, a safe and welcoming community, uh, school community. You've got uh, attracting and retaining a good staff, and there are all the different things that come along with that. If you want to prioritize what goes under that, you can. Um, but it's not something new. It's not something we. There might be some new things that we want to try, but it's it's we're always working towards that goal, those goals. I like all the stuff you've given us here. All I well, don't want to do is just renumber last year's thing. Some of those things on the board goal are good things, though, Rick. I mean, we talk as though they're not viable things. Well, I'm not saying not do them. I'm just. Well, I'm just saying they're they're they're. It's not rehashing, but it is some uh, like our safety. We've worked on that. That's been a board goal, and it has. We, I mean, they've done remarkable. I, I think we have one of the safest districts in Missouri. But it is not a thing that you stop at because there's always constantly looking and reviewing and making sure that you are uh, up to par, better than par. And it's the same thing with uh, uh, board that. goals that we have there now, like uh, I think, uh, what, uh, we're talking about staff. We're going to always need to be mindful of our staff. So that's a permanent board goal. Yeah, now, I'm, not I'm not talking about deleting anything. It's no, no, I know you're not. Update. I just think that we, we say it as though it's such a, it's a, pa it's a past tense thing or it's things that we just keep uh, re numbering, redating, but it, they're good things, and that's what I'm emphasizing. Right, and, and since I agree with that, I just want to make sure we don't let it be stale. I think the document is a summary of the goals. I mean, we're not to, like I said, there's things other people have to do to achieve those goals. We don't have to list those things, but there might be, that's just something that's, you know, that's on the wall, but behind that we know um, um, some of the things that we, uh, some of them are going to stay the same, but what we, what, what's behind, the meat behind that is what might change. Because, I mean, we always want to improve academic, in, in, grow academic achievement, we want to have those things always. We want to be conscious of our staff. That's going to always be on the list. But you know, one day we might be at twenty. We might reach the twenty percent. We might then what? Because that's what's the goal. You know, we, that's why I was saying something measurable, something specific. May, maybe that can stay the same. Not to take it off, but there's got to be something there where we go. You know what? We met our goal. So what do you guys want to actually do? Maybe we have a second. Thing that's a focus, like I don't know, like focus goals for the year, and those change out. But these are our broad term goals. I don't, I don't know if I'm just throwing them out there. 
Yeah. I do have a question about number seven. And I know you talked about the technology. I know you talked about the one-on-one -on -one program and the seniors getting their devices, but is our two-year technology plan, is that ongoing? Do we always have a, do it yes. renews itself with a new plan? And there is a the technology committee that does have a member of the Board of Education there, two, at least one, board members on that committee. Are you on that committee? There's a meeting coming up. Okay. October 10th. October 10th. Okay. But it, there's always a two-year technology plan, right? right? Yes. Yeah. So that that could stay there. And they review everything. Okay. okay. So do you want us to rewrite that or update it, or do you want to? I, you know what? I think the board could have their set of what where your targets are at. I mean, what you want as far as if it's a mission or vision. <clears throat> I'm setting the targets academically where I think we can be to improve over a set amount of time. Um, also, it's some of the other things, by improving the number of kids, for instance, that we're getting in these dual credit classes, I really do think it will improve us academically um, as far as EOC exams, ACT scores, more kids entering completers that's going to help us, would help us in the current MSIT 5 rubric and should help us in the current MSIP 6 rubric. Um, as far as students on the elementary side, anytime we can go in and reduce the number of students in the classroom, if we can get there, it's going to help uh, students academically. Um, that's those types of things. So the do it's it's, it's kind of like the, the doer part of it <laughs> set for me. I understand what needs to be done. Uh, it's just however you want it written because I think and the board, when the last time we talked about goals, and we said, you know, it said, Alan, go out and set your goals and the direction you want to go and be bold and be whatever the case may be. Uh, but you may have your own set, and you may, you know, you go from eight to six or whatever you think. But I think I know where we need to go to get the things done to make us a viable district, the one that Mr. Tony's speaking to, that we can get people that want to invest in us by coming moving here and buying homes here uh, that we need to do yeah, to, to, to show that we're a, a good school district for the kids. Well, I have a suggestion about number one. I know you said we were going to discuss it in November, but we could just shorten that for the time being and just say improve student achievement. I mean, that's our umbrella. That's the whole reason we're here. That's the number one goal is to improve student achievement. Yes. So, I don't want to sit but here we right don't now. know if we're going to, we don't know, and you said we're going to talk in November yeah. about the accreditation and this yeah. and that, but we know that we want to improve student achievement, so Every we could year. just shorten it to that. We right. could shorten a lot of these, like, Take out that couple, you do we have a couple of volunteers that want to get together and actually work on the actual wording of the document itself? Do you want Alonzo? No. <laughs> I mean, I will too. All right, I'll, I'll do it. I would. You I will. Guess. I don't know. But I don't know yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I said she would do it. I'm like, and I, well, let's just, okay, you two be in charge, but we'll all take a look at the document. And, and send them suggestions on any wording updates that you think. Who to? Beth and? Beth and Alonzo. Okay, okay. Now, is that sending each other stuff? Is that <laughs> keep us out of the sunshine law? Just send it to them, not reply. If you're, you've got two people. Well, we've right. got four now. One, two, three, four. Well, th them two no. are going to be in charge. Oh, we're all going to be those two people. participating. If you're sending one email to those two people, you don't have a four. Don't copy all. At some point, they'll send it something to me, and then we'll send it out to everybody, and it will be a board action item on the. Uh, so you agenda. want us to send our ideas to them? If you have ideas on rewording, okay. updating the document. Uh, I got around here a little while, but um, so I'm gonna be brief. The I said listen to this, and I, and I think what we have here is kind of a strategic plan. Um, you know, uh, the goals, goals usually aren't 40 goals. 
Um, th this is, uh, we talk about nuances of programs. That's, that's strategy, that, that's, that's tactical plans. Okay. So when I, my reaction to this, and, and those who are going to craft the document, I, I, I think that in the, in the, in the strategic goal-setting world, leaders take on big elephants. They take on big elephants, and they get others activating their plan, and they go hammer on the big elephants, the ones that can't move. And, and from what I heard in your action plans, the big elephants in the room is number one is what every business in America is dealing with, and that's talent shortage. It's not teacher shortage, it's talent shortage. And that goes to, to hiring, retaining, and paying people. And developing. And developing talent. It's the, it's the number one problem in America. The number two problem, I think, that can move the data in our world is class size. Now, I know you kind of said, I heard a little hedging there. I didn't hear if you were going to fight for it, okay? But I think you made a great point about what the research says. And, and, I, and if, we don't, if we don't attack that elephant and sell people that it's an inhibitor for us to doing the right thing in this community, a lot of these strategies and tactics aren't going to mount to that much compared to that one issue. Can I jump in just real quick? And yeah. How may, and the strategy of how we take a bite out of that elephant yeah. first may be where we are we're going to try one school. We're going to we're going to get the class sizes. Tactics, I yes. got it. But there's also a financial strategy. Yeah. You're going to need the money. Yes. Okay. And you might be able to sell the right selling document. Might sell that to the people. Might. The third thing is innovation. In here, I mean, I heard tactics, but the innovation goes to well. If we can't get enough teachers, how do we innovate our way so we're not encumbered by the shortage of teachers? What do we got to do to really innovate? And it also gets to, if we're going to need money, we need to figure out how do we take costs out so we can redeploy that money to the things that bring value, like class size, okay? And then the fourth thing, the elephant in the room, and I thought about this over the weekend. Um, when that drone hit that, hit that uh, oil plant in Saudi Arabia, warfare just changed, okay? And I thought about what happens when a school bomb, when a bomb with a drone hits a school. I mean, we are doing, we are all across this country, we are front dooring, bolting things down. But when things go that way, we got a problem. And I'm, and I'm suggesting to you that that's not an elephant, but it's going to come. And I, and I hope that God, it doesn't come here. But I think we got to start thinking about that because those drones are very accessible and it doesn't take much to cause real havoc in a school when that thing comes in. So that goes to training programs and all. But that's the goal would be to look at those huge elephants that nobody's looking at or they're looking at it and let's, and let's try to figure out with your think tank, what are those things, those elephants that you got to take on and bring them and, and shoot them and bring them down. And, and then, this is all good. I'm not saying it's not good, but it's, these are the things that will make, make the difference long term, I, I think, based on what I've heard. Okay. Well, see and you're, you guys aren't waiting for us to finish the document to start working on this stuff. We already know yeah. what our goals are and yeah. what your job is. So. We're done. We're going to go all here's, going. And here's going. what our promise you got to just work to do on, on the document. Yeah, I agree. Our promise to you that this is to keep you updated on these things. And we'll give yeah. you a better list. And we're going to update you, you know, every other month of where we're at and when a big event is going to occur that we're going to get knowledge from or that has occurred and the knowledge we got, we're going to bring it back to this board and say this is how this has impacted what we're trying to do here. So, so we're going to have a final board goal document too to vote on on the October agenda. Oh, Rick, what are you wanting? Wow. You wanting <laughs> us to <laughs> have a lot of <laughs> look at the board the goals from that year. document <laughs> and any updates or any ideas you have for revision. Rick, so that's in two weeks? Send to those two. Oh, is that two weeks? Because we're, we're in the special meeting. I think it's three weeks. You know, it's up to you. It's
it's up to the board, but one. It's three weeks. Three weeks. Maybe the yeah, that's you know, that's, that's good no time because you just said we're not going to re redo the whole thing. It's not like a whole scale. Oh, we were going to like start from scratch. Okay. <laughs> no, I just, I just you can put it in with the eighteen college credit hours. <laughs> Okay. You want me to make a motion to adjourn? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Mr. President, I make a motion to adjourn Second. at 7 59. Second. Second. Motion is second. My kids are going. Where's your kids? Uh, my kids drove in from Indy. What? From Indy. All right. I got one in Indy. I'm moving to DC. I don't want to stay in here. Alonzo, don't forget to vote. I'm going to do the shutdowns all the way down.